morning. It's three minutes after ten and uh, you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Three days left before the general election. Listen, I don't, I don't want to distress you. Oh, I suppose there would be some people listening who would be delighted by this observation. Um, we're about, we could be, be the filling in a far-right sandwich, couldn't we, by the end of the year? I just look. I just suddenly occurred to me as I glanced at the news and and took a tiny step back from the domestic political uh, situation that you've got the far right on the march in France, and the possible stroke probable return of Donald Trump to the White House with his increasing increasingly fascistic program in America, which puts the United Kingdom geographically speaking, we, we are the we are we could be the filling in a fascist sandwich by Christmas. Oh, my days, makes it perhaps all the more remarkable and all the more uh, uh, dangerous for Keir Starmer that this country appears poised to leap to the left. Uh, Four minutes after 10 is the time. Um, But it is to the domestic political landscape that we turn first this morning. We'll probably have a look at the situation in France a little later. I should mention that early, otherwise I get about 500 texts saying, why aren't you talking about the situation in France? I said, well, I can only talk about one thing at a time. But I shall say early that we will probably turn our attention to the rise of the far right in France. I, it, interesting that the BBC, for example, very comfortable talking about a French far right party being racist, certainly historically racist, but still not that comfortable describing far right parties in this country as racist. We may have a little look at what, what the differences are between our two respective countries. But I want to begin with... I'm going to have to use the word supermajority. And there was a little bit of me that thought, no, you shouldn't use it because it's meaningless. But it has become meaningful in a sense, albeit that it is still meaningless. It has become, if you can bear philosophy on a Monday morning, it has become simultaneously both meaningful and meaningless. Because democratically and constitutionally speaking in this country, it is meaningless. There is no such thing as a supermajority. It's a word borrowed from American politics where it is used to describe something very, very different from what right-wing media and the Conservative Party are using it to describe here. But nonetheless, it has become a shorthand version of saying a mahusive. That's a very technical term that I learned when I was doing my politics A-level. A mahusive majority for the Labour Party. So it looks to me as though the Tories are currently dedicating the last three days of the campaign to trying to spook the population by warning that Labour is about to secure a mahusive majority. And this morning, I noticed something for the first time that's a little bit embarrassing. And what I noticed was that sometimes, I think if if, if, if you use the word both as a, distri- a, a descriptive and as an affectionate p- pejorative. So I'd probably put myself in this category. A group of the electorate that we might call the sensibles, right? So you are conscious of footballification. You, for example, would be perfectly capable of recognising the awfulness of a leader of your own party. You you wouldn't have your scarf tied so tightly around your neck that you would be cheering a a Boris Johnson or a a Liz Truss or a Jeremy Corbyn if you were a Labour supporter or a a Rishi Sunak. You you, you kind of recognise the realities beyond absolutely entrenched tribal loyalties. So we will call ourselves the sensibles, those of us who perhaps recognise that there's no point having a mind if you never change it. So the sensible sometimes strive to have something sensible to say. You find yourself in in a political conversation and somehow an idea has taken hold in your mind that there is something troubling about a mahusive majority for the Labour Party. Of course, for that to work, there has to be something troubling about a mahusive majority for every party. So we would have to cast our minds back to 2019 and find out how many members of the right-wing media or the Conservative Party expressed reservations about Boris Johnson being gifted too big a mandate. A mandate, remember, that was secured after he'd chucked out of the party. Anybody prepared to stand up to him and point out the lies he was telling specifically about the plausibility or desirability of a so-called no-deal Brexit. So, 
I'm not going to double check everything, but I'm fairly confident that when Boris Johnson was marching on Downing Street with a mahusive majority and with... Uh, and on the back of the expulsion of almost everybody who was both honest and courageous, I think some honest people stayed behind who weren't courageous and some courageous people stayed behind who weren't honest. I mean, fast catamaran sailing is, yeah, it's no easy matter. But the idea that anybody was warning that Tories were going to be allowed to have too much power, unchallenged power, and that we were all supposed to clutch our pearls about it is objectively laughable, right? And this was a guy who, within minutes of getting his feet under the desk at Downing Street, was sending Jacob Rees-Mogg up to Balmoral to lie to the Queen and preparing to unlawfully prorogue Parliament. And, of course, to lie repeatedly to Parliament itself um, until he was blue in the face. So... I, I guess there is a case. There is a case for saying that a mahusive majority can be dangerous, but only if you've got a demonstrably corrupt liar in charge. And even the Tory party, in its last gasp of reasonableness or sensibleness, if you prefer, even in its last gasp of sensibleness, the Tory party got rid of Boris Johnson ultimately for being a liar. People often forget which lie it was that proved to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, quite a few of you are saying, please stop saying mahusive. Are, are we not enjoying the use of the word mahusive? It just it gives me a little place to go that's not super majority. Uh, uh, all right, huge. Huge. A huge majority. I won't say mahusive again. Well, I may allow myself a couple of mahusives, but I won't, I won't have it as my go-to adjective for the, for the potential possible Labour majority. People forget what the lie was that finally did for Boris Johnson. It wasn't a lie about parties. It wasn't a lie about COVID. It wasn't a lie about wallpaper. It wasn't a lie about Owen Paterson. It wasn't a lie about any of the uh, long list of lies that it could have been about. It was actually a lie about appointing a known sex pest to a senior position in the Conservative Party and the fact that everybody knew that he knew. So when he stood up in public and said, I had no idea, folks, that... Uh, uh, pincher by name and pincher by nature. I had no idea at all when I made that joke that he was uh, widely considered to be a danger to uh, young men in social situations. Uh, and, and everybody knew he was lying. And that was oddly the point that prompted Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid, for it was they. It's not that long ago. It's amazing how soon we forget uh, to, to, to break ranks and resign prompting Boris Johnson, of course, to, to move heaven and earth to try and cling on to power. But even with a huge stroke mahusive majority, he couldn't do it. So there came a point where the resignation of pretty much every minister in conservative clothes, although, was it James Cleverley who wrote, was it James Cleverley or Nadim Zahawi who wrote an article for The Telegraph saying we should, we should go, that was that when Truss was on her way back. That was when, no, when oh, I get so confused. But one of them wrote an article backing Johnson about 20 minutes before Johnson said, I won't be running, I won't, I won't be getting involved in this, uh, in this business. But that would be probably when Sunak got the nod after Truss had, yes, um, tanked the country. So the, the, I digress slightly. A massive majority can actually be undone if the prime minister who has secured that majority turns out to be unbearably dishonest. So even a Conservative Party whose success since 2016 has been built on lies and nonsense, still is, by the way, Rishi Stunak today claiming that Vladimir Putin wants Labour to win, completely ignoring the fact that David Cameron was hoaxed recently um, into believing that he was talking to senior Ukrainians and, and said on tape that the Labour position on Ukraine will be no different from the Conservative position. The support for Ukraine from a Labour government will be identical to the support for a Conservative government. David Cameron telling the truth in what he thought was secret doesn't stop Rishi Sunak, because Conservative success over the last eight years has been built on lies and nonsense, from claiming that, um, from claiming that, that Vladimir Putin somehow wants the Labour Party to win the general election. I don't think there's any doubt about where Vladimir Putin's loyalties lie when it comes to British politics. Um, it's been clear since and indeed before Brexit. So I am supposed to be worried about a massive majority for the Labour Party. And because I am a sensible, 
I have allowed this to seep into my thinking. Sometimes a form of political osmosis takes place, even for those of us that pride ourselves on being, or like to pride ourselves on being evidence-based or being, uh, you know, fact driven rather than feeling driven sometimes i think the chatter gets so loud or the 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 consensus becomes so clear that you almost get infected by it so i have found myself when i was touring the book i was asked a few times about this and and i found myself nodding very stroking my beard is the phrase i want not literally actually i probably did it literally stroking my beard and trying to say something sensible they're very important to say i'd like to say something sensible and if you're searching for something sensible to say you say well i do worry about the lack of accountability that would be uh contingent upon a massive labor majority and i said it for two or three uh, months of the book tour and then I got asked it again and I, I paused and I found myself thinking well hang on a minute you haven't actually thought this through you're just repeating what you think is sensible because it sounds so sensible why should I be worried about a, a Labour Party having a majority even bigger than Boris Johnson's I don't think for all his faults nobody thinks that Keir Starmer is a, a proven Uh, morally corrupt serial liar he might flip-flop a bit and you could accuse him of breaking promises made uh, in uh, in pursuit of the Labour leadership that he is not intending to keep once he's secured it but that's politics Johnson's level of lying imagine how big a liar you have to be to get kicked out by a Brexit party by a Tory Brexit party how big a liar do you have to be to get chucked out by a party whose entire electoral mandate is built on lies Answer, very big liar. Huge. Ginormous is a good word. Ginormous liar. So, quarter past ten is the time. How worried are you about the size of Labour's majority? One of the really interesting things I saw in some of the polling at the weekend was that it's had the opposite effect. Use of this word supermajority, which is, as we said, simultaneously meaningful and meaningless, Use of this word supermajority has actually galvanized Labour voters, according to one piece of polling that I saw, because of something that I said to you a few weeks ago, more in hope perhaps than expectation. But the prospect of being involved in some sort of apocalyptic electoral event could prove to be a galvanizing factor. If you're sitting there thinking, for example, there's no point voting because Labour are over the line. And you might think that as a Tory or a Labour supporter. There's no point voting because Labour are over the line. And and then you read about the prospect of an absolutely ginormous majority. You could go one or two ways, couldn't you? You could go, well, they're even further over the line than I thought they were, so I'm definitely not going to vote. Or it's as if you could become part of a 20-0 victory. Would you want to go on the pitch when they were 15-0 up and, and you'd go on as the striker? with the chance of scoring five, you could be part of a team that secures the biggest victory in the history of football or in the history of sport. So I, I wonder whether all of the talk of supermajority is having the opposite effect to what the Tories hoped and intended. So that's part of this conversation, but the central humongous, thank you, Tony, that's a beautiful word, humongous, isn't it? Absolutely, but humongous and ginormous, much nicer than mahusive. Not least because mahusive isn't an actual word. But is there actually anything to fear? Why are they doing it? Why do you actually think they're doing it? 0345 6060 973. And, and is there actually a sensible position that says no 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 there's no limit uh, no there is a sensible position that actually says no you should be concerned you can have a majority that is too big in politics james you might say to me size really does matter and it would be concerning stroke dangerous stroke discombobulating if the Labour Party were returned on Thursday with an absolutely ginormous majority. Why? Why would that be a problem? 0345 6060 973. And how dishonest is it of the Tories that barely stopped celebrating the size of Boris Johnson's majority in 2019 to treat their own supporters as if they are the stupidest people in the country? Um, All right, the second 
most stupidest collection of voters in the country. But for the Conservatives to, to say, having secured a huge majority in 2019, to, to pretend to their supporters that there's something intrinsically wrong with massive majorities, intrinsically dangerous with massive majorities... Uh, hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 973. Oliver's been in touch to say that ginormous is not an actual word either. Oliver, you're barred, mate. I'm not having that sort of talk on this program. Uh, I, so I want to talk about massive, ginormous, huge majorities. Uh, and the, the way the conversation in this country in the last couple of the weeks has focused on it and the question then of whether or not there is actually anything to worry about at all, or whether it is just another example of two things. The Tories' comfort with lying and their belief that their core support is so stupid that they'll swallow these lies just as they swallowed the 2016 lies and the 2019 lies. It could, Lord, I do apologise, it's 19 minutes past 10. 21 minutes after 10, a little hook and tease for you. Um, I, I want you to tell me what you think is the subject the British public says receives too much attention or has received too much attention during this election campaign. I may give you a little clue on this a little later, but I want you to think about it. Don't, don't ring in, just text or tweet, uh, or, or indeed WhatsApp to 03456060973. Some really interesting polling here about the top issues for voters, but also the kind of um, reverse point for voters, which is... I'm hearing far too much about something I don't really care about. So if you were to fill that category, I'm hearing far too much about something I don't really care about. What do you think that topic would be? Okay, so, so text 84850, tweet at Mr. James OB or at LBC, um, or indeed WhatsApp me on the usual number for that one. Because I, 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 well, I think it's very, very interesting. And to me, at least, supremely unsurprising. And there's, there's your first clue. Back to quotes super majority david is in burley in hampshire david what would you like to say oh, hello hello um, hello. I, hello i do hello. think that uh, a super majority um is a democratic mandate and um it's not necessarily a bad thing i don't think it's fair to put that in a negative light however in our current case yes the Labour Party are heading for a supermajority. Can we stop using that word? Case. Can we stop using that That's word? Right. Yeah, yeah, I thought absolutely. I'd made it clear. Massive, yeah. massive majority. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, or ginormous. Don't say that word. You'll upset Olive. Uh, <laughs> uh, ginormous or humongous at the moment we're running with, OK? OK, so, th so they're, they're, they're heading for a large majority. And yes. um, I think the thing, the issue here is not whether or not a large majority is a good or bad thing. Right. It's the fact that when a party is voted in based on a large majority, it's usually because of something they are offering that people really want. Yes. So uh, a policy or... Get, get Brexit done or being the best example. Get Brexit done being the best example in recent years. It doesn't matter whether it's true or f feasible or honest or not. It is a very digestible promise. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a very good example. Um, you know, they're, they're offering something that reflects what those voters actually want. And yes. um, in this case, I think that the Labour Party are heading for a massive win because of the failure of the Tory party and there's a massive rejection of the Tory party. So by default, everyone's swinging over to Labour, but they don't really know what they're going to get. And I think that that issue... Um, is, is, I mean, is at the heart of it. Yeah, I take your point, and it's a, it's, a, it's a thoughtful one. But I think possibly 2019 is too good an example because I can't really think of other general elections that have been fought on single issues. You know, the, the, the promise of change is common. Uh, I, 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 I think almost every major shift in, in leadership has come off the back of change, you know, wh whether it was in 79 or whether it was in... 97 or even 2010 yeah. i mean yeah, what, 97's I, I, a good example yeah. i mean blair, blair uh, obviously you know a lot of people who would never normally have voted labor at that time i remember my parents at the time they mm -hmm. were conservative voters for years and they went with with blair um and labor at that time and i think a lot of people did because he didn't just offer change but there was at least some substance to what they were offering and, and there was a lot more information about 
where that was likely to go. It's a and little unfair on, on. It's a little unfair on whoever wrote the Labour manifesto. But you're you're you're, you're describing <laughs> the public perceptions, perhaps, rather than the actual policy. Yeah. The policy yeah, offer yeah, is I, I is agree. a bit yeah. more substantive than. Uh, than you allow. So what, why would that be a problem then? So, so La- Labour come in with, say, 100 seats, a, a majority of 100. Why does, that, why does the fact that the vote is built largely on a desire for change and to get rid of the other lot rather than on massive enthusiasm for the new lot, why, why does that, that then become a problem? Because you don't necessarily know that you're going to get change. So, yeah, but you don't necessarily example, know that you're going to get the thing that you voted for on on a single issue promise election whatever, either. You know, you know, manifestos and politicians are renowned for not doing what they say. So, they what's a bigger? What's a, under your analysis, David? What is a bigger potential problem? Boris Johnson coming in promising to get Brexit done, uh, uh, arguably doing so, getting praised by people like Nigel Farage for doing a bang up job. And then reality arrives and it turns out that he sold the country an absolute pup. But he could do so because he had a very big majority and he had expelled, never mind silenced, all dissenters. And because, of course, Farage rolled over in 2019 and handed him 30 or 40 seats uh, that, that otherwise Labour might have won. Or, well, I think the only or, reason or, 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 or a big Labour majority in 2024. What would be more troubling under under that? Well, rule? it's hard to know because yes. we don't know what a, a Labour majority will actually bring us. At least with when Boris Johnson was voted in, he had a mandate from the people on a particular issue. Whether or not you agree that was a good issue, or whether he handled it well, or actually delivered on yes. it. Um, is is massive. It was, as we said, digestible. Digestible is a good word. Well, yeah. I mean, I think I think that the reason why Johnson got in because you had a you know the red wall voted for him because people felt that their vote for uh, leaving the EU wasn't actually actioned upon, and they had years of being told that they were racist and wrong and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So so that's why you had this huge swing, and it became a point of principle for those voters, and I think that. You know, it's a bit like what's happening now with reform in this country is that that's the, the subject that, that's coming around that. But I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the people that are backing them are doing so based on the old Brexit issue still. As in there is a great Brexit, it just goes to a different school and Farage takes no responsibility at all for, for the one that we've ended up with, despite cheering it to the rafters when Johnson signed that deal. His, his entire career is an exercise in um, uh, scrutiny, evasion and accountability dismissal up to and include, including accusing absolutely everybody now of being in on some sort of vile conspiracy against him because of all these racists that keep turning up in his party. David, thank you. So what would a smaller Labour majority deliver that a bigger Labour majority doesn't? It, it, the, the whole rhetoric is built upon the idea that, that elected Labour members would be able to force the leadership into different positions through the threat or the actuality of rebellion. I mean, Really? I, 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 that's my reading of it. I could be wrong. Thank you, David. Rob's in Seven Oaks. Rob, what would you like to say? I completely agree with you, James. And that the, that the last thing you said is completely unrealistic, right? Yes. Uh, the, the leadership is going to, or the, the uh, <laughs> when the only the, the time it happened, going to do what he needs the, the, to do. the only yeah. time it happened was when Cameron's majority was so slim exactly. that actually the extreme could put pressure on him, which is why he ended up having to promise a referendum in order to stop people like Douglas Carswell from from defecting. So it can happen, but not to Labour. Well, I mean, I think think some of the the problem here is that, uh, sort of like the previous caller said, I don't think too many people know exactly what it is that they're going to get. Yes, that's Um, true. But the point point that I made to to your researcher is that... um, All of this talk of super majorities or mahusa majorities or whatever, whatever else. <laughs> what a silly um, word. I, I, it, what a silly word, exactly. But I don't think any of it actually cuts through too much because the reason that people are voting at the moment um, is to get rid of the conservative MPs and liars and goons and freaks and whatever we're allowed to call them yes. that have let the country down so badly after the last and, and so that's years. possibly why it's having the opposite effect. They're saying it's going to be huge, and people are saying, "Well, I'll have a bit of that." Uh, that's exactly exactly. It's not really so much about how huge the Labour majority is; it's about how few Tories how few are left. These lying Tories are, are, are left and actually um, punished punished for the for the it, lies well, of the last yeah, eight but, years. It, 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 Perhaps, and I mean, you know, there's a fair bit of sort of schadenfreude that's driving me forward, even though in uh, 
uh, Seven Oaks, which now looks Can- to No, 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 the- no, no, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> the full list of candidates in Seven Oaks is available at lbc.co.uk slash candidates. Did we ever get a jingle made for political per de paranoia? Ba, 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 ba. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, 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 I take your point. And in fact, you've reminded me of a possible topic, probably for later in this week, but before Thursday which will be the favourite Portillo moments. The problem with Portillo... Oh, this is going to be an absolute feast for fans of alliteration. The problem with Portillo moments is political per de paranoia because I would like to know which uh, results you perhaps are most potentially, another P word for you, excited about in the context of a Portillo moment, when Portillo lost his seat in 1997, it was such a seminal event in British electoral history that the phrase Portillo moment has entered the political vocabulary to describe seeing somebody um, previously perceived. God, the peas are just flowing like peas this morning. That previously perceived as pr- a prominent politician from a party of government being unexpectedly defeated so we could do if we do what what is your favorite portillo moment i will have to say probably on loop a full list of candidates is available at lbc.co.uk forward slash candidates it's ten thirty one. thomas watts has your headlines Ten thirty four is the time you're listening to james o'brien on lbc so here's is i sort of use the word stupid a bit too much it's not a very kind word but here's the reason why i've used the word stupid today to describe people who fall for The Tories claim that a massive Labour majority is something they should be worried about when they, in 2019, couldn't stop crowing about the size of Boris Johnson's majority. Here's the reason why I think that stupid is is a description of their behaviour in this context. Perhaps uh, calling them stupid people is perhaps unfair. If, if, If you are here now, if Rishi Sunak is here now, and you say to him, why should I be worried about Labour's majority being the size of Boris Johnson's or even bigger than Boris Johnson's. Why should I be worried about that? What would he say? You see? This is what they've been doing now since David Cameron resigned, really, is they've just been saying effective things. It's like they govern according to your Uncle Keith's Facebook page. They they just say catchy things. And we may talk about Facebook a little later in the programme because something truly extraordinary has happened in the Daily Mail today, something which I don't think the editor of the Daily Mail realises he's done. But there is a story in the day or some commentary in the Daily Mail today that is, for those of us who've been paying attention to Brexit and and, and the rest of it and Russian influence as a clue for you, it is genuinely extraordinary what has appeared in the Daily Mail today. Do not let me forget that. I often joke about forgetting things when I promise to tell you later. Do not let me forget this one, all right? It's on pain of death that you allow me to forget this. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write it on a post-it note. Can you hear that? In case you think this is fake news, I'm going to tear the post-it note off the pad. I'm going to stick it to my screen, and I am not going to forget to tell you the mad thing that has appeared in the mail today. Uh, not least because it may still, it may yet be a topic. But if you said to uh, to, to someone, "Go, oh, I'm very worried about the size of Keir Starmer's potential majority," and you simply said the most important question you can ever ask, you simply said, "Why?" Second most important question you can ever ask after what was it like. He simply said, why? What would they say? What would they say? Alison is in Lewisham. Alison, what would you like to say? Um, well, a couple of things before I, before I say what I want to say. Firstly, my two Portillo moments would be... No, gentle. no, shush, 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 shush. You're not allowed to do that. I've got to, I've got to walk a tightrope of political per de paranoia before... Eleanor doesn't even want me to do the topic at all. And to be honest, Alison, you've just given her quite a lot of ammunition for, 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 for that. So don't, no, no, no. Carry on. Okay, Thank I won't you. say what the other no, one is. No, 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 don't. I didn't even hear the first one. But if I did, I would just <laughs> okay, stroke my beard and go, hmm, interesting, without expressing any opinion whatsoever. And a full okay. list of candidates for anything you did or didn't say is also available at lbc.co.uk forward slash candidates. Can we walk away from that te- territory at speed, please? Yes, we Thank will you. take several steps back from that and just say, I do actually hope there will be a significant labour majority. Right. But my, my point would That's be, allowed. actually, <laughs> my point would be that actually an enormous majority is actually more of a worry for the party who has the enormous majority. Because Why? when you have a vast number of, of MPs milling yes. round in Parliament without, you know, 
idle hands, you know, the devil makes work for idle hands yes. kind of thing, you end up with a situation like the Tory party has now when you have ridiculous things like the five families, as they like to call themselves, oh. that they, they, you know, they mischief make in amongst themselves where there is no, you know, where they can't be held to account by an opposition. Factionalism. There are so many... Uh, Exactly. Yes. And, and that would be the thing that would be worrying because, oh. you know, you, you, can, you can sometimes see it in local government where, you know, one party holds all the seats and there is no opposition. So what yes. do they do? They start fighting amongst themselves. Especially arguably, on the left, although your example is, is from the right. With the five, my example five the families, right, but the left honestly. are the same. And, yes. and the, you know, the, the truth of the matter is actually we have Brexit because that happened within the Tory party. Yes. Because there was, you know, the, the right wing of the Tory party was taking over and they were getting increasingly scared by what might happen with Farage and so forth. Um, that their, their answer to sorting out the problems in the party was actually to put up um, a right, referendum. I, I challenge one element of your analysis. I think, which is that the right wing wasn't taking over the right wing because Cameron's majority was so small, was exercising a disproportionate amount of influence upon the leadership, scaring David Cameron against George Osborne's advice into calling that referendum as a promise he thought he'd never have to keep because he thought he'd be back in coalition in 2015. So so that is the, 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 the dangers of a small majority highlighted yes. by that, not, yes. not a big one. But yeah, I you're, suppose that's fa- true, but you, you also have to take into account that David Cameron was so arrogant that he didn't think he would lose. Yeah. But, you know, well, that, that's by the by. But, but that would be my concern about an enormous majority, that actually it makes the, it makes the party in power, whichever power it is, whichever yeah. party it is, Vulnerable. it makes them unmanageable. Well, that's certainly not what the Tories would say. So if, if he was sitting here now, an unlikely prospect. But if he were sitting here now and I said, sorry, what am I supposed to be worried about with, with a massive Labour majority, Mr Sunak? What would he say? He would say, I've got all the... Well, he would say, it's absolutely great. I've got this wonderful majority. I can do whatever I like. But, you know, the evidence of his own eyes would tell him that actually it's, it's broken up into all these various factions and, you know, it's... it's so, he's ended uh, up where he is yeah, he's unmanaged, yeah, but he wouldn't, say, he wouldn't say that, would he? Because that would be bad for Labour. In terms of bad for voters, what would he say? Why why should I fear a Labour majority, a massive Labour majority? Rishi Sunak isn't going to say because of factionalism and infighting, is he? Well, no. So what would he say? He probably probably wouldn't say it in public debate. (laughs) (laughs) But what would he say in public debate? That's the question. So, you know, you've got all the front pages about it. The Daily Mail has a guide to tactical voting. Don't lock in Labour for a generation. We've introduced this ludicrous misnomer, supermajority, to British political discourse. Um, And yet, if you were to say to Rishi Sunak this morning, what am I supposed to be worried about, mate? What would he actually say? 10.40 is the time. Alison, thank you. Couple of phone lines free. Remember, as soon as you struggle to get through early doors, as soon as I bid farewell to somebody on air, it means that a phone line is being imminently vacated and you can grab it by dialing 0345 6060 973 is, uh, is the number you need. Mark's in Mill Hill. Mark, what would you like to say? What do you reckon? Hi, I'm Hello. James. Thanks Hello. for taking my call. Um, well. Yeah, it's... Um, w- it's almost a case of looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. Oh, yes. We're not actually... If there was a supermajority... Oh, sorry, if it was a humongous uh, majority... Yes. Um, obviously, there's the problem of factionalism to which your previous caller alluded and the devil making work for idle hands yes. and all that sort of business. However, the biggest problem, if you have... A really massive majority, yeah, and your opposition so doesn't have that many MPs, yeah. sort of like below 140, 120. Yeah, um, you don't have enough MPs to run a proper opposition. But what does that mean? You, well, you don't have enough MPs to shadow the government. Number one, wow. and number two, yeah, you absolutely. don't have enough MPs to staff the committees. Um, so this is this is more about the paucity of the opposition than it is about the size of the majority. I know that they're intrinsically linked, but it's not a, it's not a danger of Labour having a huge number of seats. It's actually the danger of the opposition having a tiny number of seats, which, which are slightly different things, aren't they? Uh, well, yeah, but you don't you don't you're not going to sell it. If you're Rishi Sunak you're, or Oliver Dowden or whoever, you're not going to try and sell that 
from the point of, from the perspective of it no, won't no, be no, enough don't, of give it, don't give us too few seats no, no so they can't again it's a brilliant answer like Alison's but it's not an answer to the question of what would Rishi Sunak say if he was here because he couldn't sit there and say well we might not be able to shadow everybody if you don't if we don't go any because that's not that's not landing uh, in in his political rhetoric it's landing in your political reality how many cabinet positions do you think there currently are in the united kingdom's government mark well the pop uh, test pop cabinet, quiz pop quiz cabinet, cabinet so is, yeah cabinet is 21 oh number of or it's 22 like that. well that's fantastic i wouldn't have I, I i probably would have got high teens i reckon that's well played and uh, the uh, the number of ministers and Yes. Secretaries of State is limited by law to 109. So they could have they could be below that figure. Yes. And that would then create constitutional problems. Arguably. Well, uh, it's 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 management. It, the, basically the government and gets committees to, do the provide government, scrutiny. The government gets to run you ragged basically. Yeah. No, well, they, this is the best answer. I, well, this plus Alison, it's a brilliant combination of answers to the objective question, not of course to the question of what Rishi Sunak would say if he was here, but but we'd be so weak, we wouldn't really be able to do anything and and therefore the government would perhaps be able to run ragged. And you've actually answered, I think you have. I'll just double check. You've actually answered the question that I thought was the zinger I was keeping in my back pocket on this one, which was, what's the difference, though, between a majority of, say, 40 and a majority of, say, 200? And I think you've answered that question, haven't you? Uh, uh, well, yes. I mean, effectively, I think also there's a, there's a, there's a deeper problem, which is you almost have the... If you have a really large majority, yes. you almost have the ability to in a kind of imperial way, say, actually, we will be our own opposition. Yeah. You can actually send away 90 of your MPs to be a sort of, uh, let's say, Labour for the regions as yeah. a new party, and then they're your opposition. But they, they're kind of, um, you know, a puppet opposition. Oh, no, well, uh, yeah, and, and you would have... Actually, I mean, the one thing that would give perhaps some challenge to your analysis is that certainly in committee, Labour members will be very confident speaking truth to power, picking over policy, looking at records, uh, quizzing cabinet ministers, quizzing uh, senior politicians, because that, that is the purpose of committees. And, and you think of the example of someone like Chris Bryant, who I don't think has a shadow brief at the moment, but I can't imagine someone like Chris Bryant is going to go easy on his own people, um, uh, any easier on his own people than he would do on on the other lot, just as the Tories that were ultimately responsible for, for pulling down Boris Johnson's pants uh, select committee, that they were on, they, they were Tories on the select committee that found him to be in contempt of Parliament. So the, the footballification is probably at its weakest in committee, and the numbers are low enough under some analyses to threaten the actual personnel. What's the word I'm looking for? Crewing almost of the committees. That's a great point from Mark. I, I don't know how you're hearing this. You're hearing this going, yes, that's a great point from Mark. But I'm still supremely comfortable with a massive majority. It's 10.46. It is 10.48. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'll deliver you one of my little teasers now. This I just found this really interesting, I have to say, because it tallies with not only my own feelings and instincts and indeed experiences. I've, I've said to you before that you can see the screen. You can see how, how, how many calls are coming in on given topics, even when you're not on air at LBC. And the obsession with one issue that you hear some, sometimes in the schedule has always struck me as really odd because it doesn't excite any response at all from listeners. But it is something that's constantly punted by the Daily Mail. And indeed, it is punted today. But they have done some research into the issue about which the British public feel public discourse focuses too much on and about which they actually care the least. So Britain's top issues are our cost of living, supporting the NHS, climate change, the war in Ukraine, affor affordable housing, mental health, and then asylum seekers crossing the channel. But if you were to follow some coverage and some Tory rhetoric, you'd be very surprised to discover something that's not in that list of the top five or, 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 or six. Crime comes next. Jobs and, and employment comes after that. Social care for the elderly is after that. Brexit is after that. 
Racism in society is next. COVID-19 is next. Improving education is next. And um, cost of availability of childcare is next. So what is the topic that the British public um, says that we talk about far too much in public discourse because about it, we do not care. 2% of the population describing it as, as the thing that they care most about. What, what, can, it, can you spot what it is yet? Can I go, let me just go to my inbox and see if anybody's got Yeah, well done, Johnny. Johnny's got it. Transgender stuff. How, how many times have I suggested to you that it is nowhere near the issue that you would believe if you spent your life on Twitter or plugged into Mail Online or indeed perhaps listening to some... Um, uh, not so much phone-in radios, but listening to presenters who are supposed to be doing phone-in radio, but generally when they turn their attention to trans, struggle to get anybody to phone in. And, and that is why. At 2%. And I'm surprised that the small boats are so low down the list as well. But, uh, but again, I'm unsurprised because it's a media obsession, but not one that if you're worried about the cost of living, unless you've somehow been persuaded that some poor soul in a dinghy is the reason why your boss is paying you buttons... Um, it is, is so far down the list as well. So the, the list of Britain's top issues, once again, in order, cost of living, uh, supporting the NHS, asylum seekers crossing the channel, um, uh, climate change and the environment, affordable housing, the war in Ukraine, jobs and unemployment, Brexit, NHS is growing, asylum seekers fluctuates. That's, um, that, that was in April 2023. It's, it's lower now. These things are fascinating, aren't they? But But the trans question is absolutely um, the lowest it's ever been. Sorry, I was reading the one from 2023. This is the one from 2024, and that's the one that has got um, what submits uh, trans issues at the very, very, very bottom of the list. 10.52 is the time. Suresh is in Wembley. Back to the huge majority, Suresh. What is going on? I think that the Tories are desperate and, frankly, quite hypocritical about all this. Uh, their their policy is just not getting traction. They're um, what twenty points behind in the polls. Hasn't I moved mean, since the election was called, that, has it? That's quite an interesting thing. Yeah, I mean, and since then it hasn't changed much. No, I, I personally don't think that uh, the majority is going to be as huge as um, why not the Tories are trying to make out. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people who probably aren't going to come out to vote. Yeah. I mean, that, that's my concern. And I think they probably want to suppress the Labour vote. Um, I mean, you know, just they're quite hypocritical about it. I mean, they don't go around saying when they... Uh, so you think vote, it's going to work you know, then? Let, w- warning. Vote, but not, don't too many of us vote for us. Yeah. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to... It shows that... It, but that's, what they, that's how it come they're so desperate about it. You know, their policies they're pushing forward are not getting traction with people. People are fed up with what they've done. They thrashed the um, the NHS. Um, almost everything they touched. Look at what they've done with the HS2. It's been a complete... It's an extraordinary mess. moment, wasn't it? Just calling the whole you know, thing off after spending yeah, millions yeah. on it. In I mean, fact, you know, speaking absolutely. of... Hang on. Speaking of spending yeah. millions, I'm doing pop quizzes today. Uh, how much money do you think has been spent and will not be in any way recoupable, it cannot be reclaimed, on the so-called Rwanda scheme? Uh, it's about £300 million. My listeners are so much cleverer than me. This is ridiculous, £320 yeah, and, and million. On, uh, Well yeah, done. But on HS2... It's these these are rubbish, these quizzes. Everyone knows the answers. Quizzes are supposed to create some jeopardy, Suresh. David knew how many people there are in the cabinet. It was out by one. You knew how much had been spent on Rwanda. You, you were out by a tiny percentage of 320 million. I need to come up with tougher questions. Yeah, you do. All right, carry and, on. Uh, and on the HS2, it's billions, not millions that they've, uh, yes, this that is they've true. wasted. Well, I, I, yeah, but they have built something. It's not like Rwanda. They're, they're, they're just, they've cancelled bits Yeah, but bit, they've only of built it. less than half of what they were intending. Yeah, I know. I'm not defending it. I'm not defending it. But, um, yeah, but I mean, coming back to the question, I mean, yeah. you know, just it's just the you know, look up on the the hypocrisy of it. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what I am doing. Eighty seats in two thousand and nineteen. I mean, I, I, do, I mean what, what what was said by reform uh, candidates about Sunak was dreadful, but the Tories were using the same tactics about subject um, about um, uh, 
Right. Khan, um, Sadiq uh, Khan, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. You're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, well, you know, they I had forgotten about tactics. that. Yeah, they didn't use the they same language. The we, we, they didn't use the not same language. Not quite the same language. Not quite but the same language. But they were arguably flirting with Islamophobic tropes when talking about. Well, Susan they Hall, just I think, floating with them. They were, they were, you know, um, going all in. The the, the, uh, the Tory candidate liked Enoch Powell. This is true. You know, uh, you just just is to- total t- Tory hypocrisy. Yeah, it's a very good they, point. They're actually, lose, they're losing on the argument of uh, of their policies. The and so this, this is just what have we got? Change. What can we scare them with? All we can do is scare people. We can't. We can't. Obviously, after fourteen years, we can't really claim that that, that that we've done. Although he did claim that people were better off now that or, or having better lives in twenty fourteen and twenty twenty four than they were in twenty ten. So what can we scare them with? Without uh, I, cross our fingers, they won't think about things too deeply. We'll scare them with the size, the size of Labour's potential majority. Suresh, thank you. I, I must read this actually from. Sarah, who's no, I don't think she's cross with me, but she makes a valid point. James, people keep spouting Tory propaganda about not knowing what we'll get with Labour. I thought it only fair to do a quick summary from the manifesto. I would be very grateful if you could read it out to remind people. It's not everything, but it covers a lot of the main points. It's not bad for starters, she suggests. 40,000 NHS appointments every week, double the number of CT stroke MRI scans scanners, 700,000 urgent dentist appointments, free breakfast clubs in primary schools, investment in HMRC to reduce tax avoidance, 6,500 new expert teachers, 3,000 new nurseries, mental health support for every school, young futures hubs like a sort of sure start for teenagers, 8,500 new mental health staff and a green energy plan including the National Wealth Fund, Home Insulation and Great British Energy. That's from Sarah who's in Surrey. Feel free if you are so minded to provide me with a similar thumbnail sketch of what you think the Tory promises are because at the moment it seems an awful lot of their campaign is focused upon trying to scare us into thinking that it would be bad if Labour's majority was too big. Mike's in Portsmouth. Mike, what would you like to say? Hi James, how are you? Very well Mike, what's on your mind? Uh, I mean Suresh kind of touched on the point that I was going to make um, but I wanted to take it a little bit further and say actually bearing in mind the Tories are now pretty much desperate um, it's actually probably the smartest thing they can do uh, because what they're hoping for is... Um, unless they, it isn't, of course. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. <laughs> but at the moment, I think this is the best thing they can do. That's different, um, yeah. That, or or because, the only the only thing. Yes, it could still the be the best thing. thing they could do. It doesn't mean it's actually a good thing, but it's the best no, thing. but what it really does, and you've got to remember, all of the Tory scandal and all of the miserable things that they've done over the past few years, yes. uh, it's still pretty raw in people's minds. So if they can now say, well, this is what we did with a large majority... Don't expect anything better from Labour. Uh, it does actually work. And I, I've spoken to quite a few friends and family, and, and uh, it, there does seem to be a lot of people who are going down the route of, well, I'm not going to vote because they're all the same. Mm. And, and it, it, so it does work to an extent. I mean, the needle's not moving a great deal, so it's not. I don't think it's going to really ultimately work, but it does have an impact. If you, if you can convince everyone that, look what we've done with this huge majority, it's made your life miserable. Mm. Um, Labour are going to do exactly the same, if not worse. And and then you plant it on 80% of the British papers in the morning. Uh, it does it does get through, and I think that's the best they so can do So it's going to right make now. people less likely to vote at all. It's not going to turn people back towards the Tories, then, under your analysis. A little bit of both. I think, also, the other the other thing I hear from friends is, is this whole... I, I don't really want to vote for Tories, but I can't vote for Labour, mm. um, which seems to be... You're hearing that this time round. I, I heard that a lot in 2019. I haven't heard it that much this time round, but it must be out there. Yeah, and, and uh, quite a lot of it comes down to this. Uh, this, uh, And this is, again, something that I personally would look forward to, is, is the lack of sort of charisma from Starmer. But yeah. I, I'm looking forward to someone boring. Uh, and consistent being in charge. Well, he's not. Yeah, I mean, you, you'd have thought so. It's only in recent years I've understood why the phrase "May you live in interesting times" is considered to be a curse by the Chinese. I always thought it was a sort of good luck message. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, I don't know what we want to talk about next. We probably should we move on from this now? Have we done enough on on the so-called supermajority and and the uh, difficulties of pinpointing precisely what it is the Conservatives want us to be frightened of? Uh, Democrats, with a small d, could and did indeed make an excellent point for why the, the, the simple numbers may threaten democratic scrutiny. But for the Conservatives to say, listen, if, if, if everyone votes Labour, there won't be enough of us to put up shadows for every ministerial post in government would, would sound a little bit too pathetic for them to countenance. So 
If we were to turn our attention to events across the channel, where the far right really is on the march, and ask, what's the difference between there and here? Three minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, one of the more gratifying, I've mentioned this a few things, a few things, a few times. Uh, one, one of the more gratifying developments in recent years on the show, this show, has been the confirmation of our suspicions that we have extended our tentacles far beyond our borders. Because, I mean, one thing we can all agree on is that we must control our borders. But we have managed to extend our tentacles far beyond the borders of the United Kingdom, whether people are listening live elsewhere in the world or whether they are listening uh, on catch-up. I, I should remind you, actually, that there's a full podcast of every show available sort of usually early afternoon from um, uh, Global Player and, and you know, all, all the usual outlets, but I would recommend Global Player, obviously. Uh, and the, the, that's going great guns. I thought it would tail off. But I think a lot of people discovered us during COVID and, and when their routines changed back to what they were before, uh, we managed to hang on to you, for which I'm really grateful. It's incredibly uh, uh, gratifying to see those numbers for the, for the podcast of The Daily Show and indeed everybody watching on YouTube, where we're also, thanks largely to, to the efforts of my colleague Matt, we're making enormous, enormous uh, uh, strides on YouTube as well. So do remember to, what do I say, Keith? Hang on a minute. Just talk among yourselves. Ring, ring the bell. What? There's no actual bell. I made that up. But don't. Hey, thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. Hi, hi. What? Who can subscribe? Like, like. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you said Mike. I thought you said Mike can subscribe. I thought I've got to get more than Mike on board. I can't just build my YouTube audience entirely on people called Mike. But Mike, it's good to see you. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and maybe ring a bell. See you later, YouTubers. Uh, five minutes after 11 is the time. But it means that we have now got the confidence to have conversations about international politics with each other. I, I don't just mean we'll talk to Lewis Goodall a little later because he is um, in France at the moment, uh, my, my LBC colleague and, of course, one of the hosts of the News Agents podcast. But, but as we discovered, I think, during Brexit, and it really came home during COVID when we were saying, what's happening in your country? There were times during COVID when I'd look at the switchboard and every single line into the building was from overseas. And it was so interesting to find out what other countries were doing, especially in the early days when people were telling us about the emergency situations that were being deployed in our comparable European neighbours compared to, at the time, the very laissez-faire, it's French that is, a very laissez-faire approach being adopted by Boris. I say laissez-faire, that's quite generous. A sort of let the bodies pile high approach being adopted by Boris Johnson. Uh, as a quote attributed to him, of course, by, by Dominic Cummings. But it means that when I say that... For almost as long as I've been doing this job, I've been reading in right-wing media in this country that France is about to fall to the far right. Or, or rather, I mean, they don't use that kind of language, do they? That, that, that France is, is about to deliver a far right revolution. The far right are about to change the game in French politics. I've been hearing this for the best part of 20 years. And I'm hearing it again now. The difference being that this time it seems to be true. Certainly the overnight results in the first round of voting in the French parliamentary elections suggest that Emmanuel Macron has made a massive error. I nearly said it then. Has made an absolutely humongous error in calling this election early. It, I mean, it looked a little petulant at the time, didn't it? You would have thought that he would sleep on it. It, it, it looked a little bit as if... The shooing that they took in the European elections was so violent that he, he kind of called their bluff or sought to um, consolidate anti uh, reassemblement national feeling in, a, in, a, in an electoral way in order to kind of put the lid on the surge that Marine Le Pen's party enjoyed in the Euro elections. So he gambled on a snap vote after that defeat. And by most accounts, it appears to have spectacularly backfired because whichever way you dice it, the far right leaders party won 34 and a half percent of the vote. Now, if you add together the two major opposition groupings, then they're closer to 50 um, percent. But of course, they can't agree with each other about anything. So you've either got a leftist leftist coalition 
under the title The New Popular Front, or Mr Macron's Together Coalition, which came in third on 22 and a half. That's according to the first exit poll. And turnout was really high, which is also really bad news for Macron, because normally galvanising the population with the fear of the uh, uh, far right is a way of getting the, uh, if you like, the lethargic or the less enthusiastic voters out. But but man, it, turnout being very high and National Rally doing very well is, I think, Macron's worst nightmare. However, I'm all right at British politics, although you quite often fill in the gaps in my knowledge and understanding, for which I will never stop being grateful. I'm not that good at French politics. There's a lot of things I don't understand. And that is why the question I'm about to ask is, what, what are the key differences, particularly in the context of far-right politicians, what are the key differences between the United Kingdom and France? And I don't think I am going to offend anybody with what follows, but, but let me apologise in advance if I do and assure you that it is unintentional. As I have told you on a few occasions, I am very happy to offend people intentionally, but if I accidentally do it unintentionally, then sometimes I need to pause and wonder whether an apology or a, or a retranchement is necessary. I have spent quite a bit of time in France, not as much time as I've spent in Greece, which has also, of course, had its flirtations with the far right over the years. Um, I was, I'm always surprised when I'm in the south of France by the popularity of the, what used to be called the National Front or the Front National. It, it, it's it, there's not. I mean, Bridget Bardo was a good example of this. She, towards the end of her life, was quite a passionate advocate of of um, Marine Le Pen and I think her dad as well, who was a, a particularly uh, interesting character. So that always surprises me because I have a kind of slightly naive idea that the more comfortably off you are, the less likely you are to fall for the rhetoric of, of blaming foreigners for everything, which is really at the heart of everything that we call far right, isn't it? Uh, whether legal or illegal, asylum seekers or refugees, economic migrants or just your neighbours, it's all their fault. Everything bad is all the fault of the foreigners, not the fault of anybody else. And they throw in a little bit of elites, but it's the elites fault. There's so many foreigners. Um, that surprises me. The thing that surprises me the most, and this is where I worry that I may be unintentionally offensive, is that they've had a go at nationalism. They've had a go at the far right. They did it during Nazi occupation. They had a regime in Vichy, which was all of the things that many far right people or many so-called nationalists think offer the solutions to a country's problems. I would have thought that countries that had had experiences, and I must be wrong about this because... Whatever you may think of the Conservative Party, they have not enacted policies that treat legal residents of a country differently according to their origins. And, and that is pretty much where far right stroke excess nationalism leads. And so I would have thought that the I mean, I don't know, is this naive? I, I can't believe a country that was occupied by the Nazis 80 years ago now delivers 34.5% of the vote to a party that is closer on the scale of uh, political ideology to the Nazis than it is to the current president. That's the bit I struggle with. And, and maybe I'm misrepresenting France or misunderstanding the history of it, but I'm going to be completely honest with you and ask you to be the same with me. Um, Bridget Bardo is still alive, apparently. I do apologise for that. She's 90 in September. Um, right, good luck to her. 12 minutes after 11 is the time. That, that's the question I've got. Talk me through the major differences, the key differences between the United Kingdom and France. And, and remember, there's a, there's a lot of talk about how, you know, this country doesn't have a problem with the far right, Farage notwithstanding. But some of the stuff that the Conservatives have done in recent years is very right-wing. It, it, it's not what I would call far-right. The Rwanda policy is incredibly right-wing. It's, it's, it's really nasty, but it's not far-right in the, in the sense of people who are all... in the sense of treating Brit citizens of a country differently according to their origins, um, whether it's a sort of religious assignation built upon origin or whether it's a geographical or an ethnic 
origin. So what are the key differences between the United Kingdom and France in the context of far-right politics? Some of the answers might include the electoral system, which you shouldn't presume we know a lot about if you're fully clued up on how the French electoral system changes the picture. 0345 606 is the number that you need. Um, I, I don't know whether you'd be qualified to answer the next question, but that's up to you. I, I will encourage you to have a go. What would it mean for the UK to have a far-right government in place in France, which, which could be in place by the end of next week? Um, hit the numbers now. You will get through. I want the key differences and the potential impacts upon us, upon the United Kingdom. You don't have to be in France to answer this question. You could just be French or you could be a student of French politics. But I, I do want to be clear from the start that I am on relative, not thin ice, but I am on, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not speaking to you from a position of great knowledge. I, I rely entirely upon British coverage of French events, which is sparse at the best of times and possibly a little excitable at times like this. So if you if you can give me a quick heads up on the key differences between the United Kingdom and France in the context of far-right politics, and it can include anything from the electoral system to uh, 20th century history and and hopefully everything in between and then if you fancy it a word on what it would mean for the united kingdom to have a far-right government in place on the other side of la manche 0345 973 is the number that you need it is 16 minutes after 11 and the question is as the uh, leader of the hard right national rally, as the Daily Telegraph chooses to call it. Um, uh, listen, the nomenclature is interesting. It's important that you know the National Front, as it was founded in 1972 and has latterly become the uh, National Rally or the Rassemblement National, uh, accepted Nazi collaborators into its ranks when it was formed by Marine Le Pen's father who was himself convicted of, of contesting crimes against humanity for saying that the Nazi occupation of France was, and I quote, not particularly inhumane. Um, in 2015, he called the Nazi gas chambers, and I quote again, a detail of history. So this is the party of which we speak. If you want to split hairs about, here you go, idiot's corner for Stuart. Anything O'Brien doesn't like is far right. A party that accepts Nazi collaborators into its ranks, pal. That is far right. Also, how can marzipan be far right, you fool? Um, we haven't done enough Idiot's Corner lately, have we? Which is uh, probably a mark of being distracted by other things. And I wasn't suggesting very, very quickly that the YouTube channel is live. You can't watch me live. Uh, it, it, you, can, you can catch the program later on YouTube. And don't forget to ring that bell so that you get motivated. M motivated? That's a good word that I just made up. You get motivated of new, uh, new programs. Hey, YouTubers. 18 after 11 is the time. So what, what, are, the, what are the key differences? Um, and what will the impact upon us be? Jonathan is in Saint-Gervais-les-Bains. Jonathan, bonjour. Bonjour. Hi, James. Good Hello. to speak to you again. Likewise. What would you um, like to say? Hi. Well, uh, yeah, well starting since, since you started on Le Pen, that, Le Pen Senior, that might not even be um, the worst of his crimes. There's evidence, actually, to, to suggest he might have been involved in literal... Um, extrajudicial killings in Algeria. So, um, yeah, I don't, extreme right is is, <laughs> is, is certainly is a fair uh, description. A, applicable, yeah. I, I, and what and what Marine, his daughter, of course, her great success has been to try and sanitise the party. To to de some detoxify degree. is the word I see a lot. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Just, just to appear, you know, younger and have a blue bob, wear chic Chanel suits instead of. But, um, phone, line, phone line's a bit dodged, Jonathan. I don't know if you've changed your locale since you spoke to the producer. But I, if, if I, haven't, I haven't. All right, well, we'll, 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 we'll crack on, but if it, if it doesn't improve, we will move on. So to your central point, a ASAP. Well, so, so the, um, uh, in terms of the differences, the big advantage of the French system is that um, you, you have a two-round system. So um, although um, at the moment it, it seems as though the... Um, uh, national rally has has has, um, has 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 got a big lead. Um, what normally happens is, um, and in fact, Jean Luc Mélenchon, the leader yeah. of the, um, the 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 left coalition, has already said that in seats where there's a three way standoff and his party's third, they will stand aside so they won't stand a candidate. So that will oh, okay. turn it into a two way. 
Um, and th- th- Macron's also said that he'll do that in seats where he, he hasn't said it'll do it every seat, but he said it'll do it, he'll do it in seats where the Republicans, the other right wing party, um, is in is in um, second place. So it tends to turn it into it, it's not exactly don't panic, but we have been here before. Uh, not fact, with thir- not himself. quite not with thirty four and a half percent. I don't think in the first round, um, or maybe we have not 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 in an assembly election. I no. think in the in the presidential. presidential election where Macron himself got in and came from nowhere as an outsider, he actually won because everyone rallied round the don't vote for um, Le Pen. Um, so it, it 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 could be. I, I mean, I think we're still looking at a, a, a big change of seats. We're probably looking at almost a swap. Between right. Macron's ensemble, which is, which is a minority anyway in the assembly at the moment, which is part of the reason why he's been such an idiot calling this um, snap election because he's yeah. managed to govern perfectly well with, with without having why a did majority. He do it? For why the did most he do part. it, Jonathan? I know that I know the, the easy answer about the scale of Le Pen's success in the Euro elections, but he didn't have to do it. And I've read the Machiavellian idea that he's showing the public what it would look like if the far right got got their hands on the levers of power, and that will scare them off making her president in a couple of years' time. But that's an incredibly irresponsible way to treat the nation. Yeah, I, I, I think those are two parts of it. I think the other part um, is that it's very rare for the left wing to um, rally together in the way that they've managed to. Jean-Luc Mélenchon oh, okay. is incredibly unpopular among the other left wing parties. And they've managed to get together a really, really wide grouping really quickly. Like, So they've got the left wing coalition has got everyone in it from literal communists. Yeah. to quite left-wing green parties to, um, you know, sort of middle-of-the-road right. socialist parties. Yes. Normally, they can't stand each other. Um, you know, well, my the, enemy's enemy, is my, my like, enemy's enemy yeah, is my friend. Well, they're, they're, they're more like People's Party of Judea stuff. They're, they're, <laughs> they're literally often, um, yes. you know, they hate each other more than they hate the right. Um, I hear you. But 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 they've they've managed to get it together this time, and and um, so it's all to play uh, for in a week. We shouldn't read too too much into. We shouldn't no. read. We shouldn't read everything into what's happened overnight. What what is the what does the French media look like? Here, I give you two examples from right wing British newspapers. Uh, Le Pen, I have wiped out Macron. So she must have said that for the Daily Telegraph to yeah. report it. And then the Daily Mail, shockwaves in France as Le Pen set to win majority. What does Francois look like or Le Figaro? What 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 are the French media saying this morning? Well, we... I, I I mean I think they I think they are pretty terrified. I mean it, mm. it's definitely not it's definitely not a normal situation. Um, it, it, you know it, it's quite possible that she. It's, it's still possible she will have a majority um, in the Assemblée Nationale. It's, it's very possible she'll have the largest party. So it's definitely not nothing, even if the cordon sanitaire is run out, which That's is the, the method of, yeah. you know, of voting for yes. whoever's not Le Pen. Um, it's still quite possible she could end up with, um, you know, two, 230 to 280 seats out of 577. And then, it's all, and then it's all to play for in the presidentials in a couple of years' time, which is where Macron looks even more irresponsible, perhaps, than he does in the analysis of the decision to call this election. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Have a great day. Uh, I, we may be picking your brains again on, on um, French political matters early next week, of course. Uh, my friend Dinah Jane, who is very um, up on these things, has been in touch to tell me that my Parisian friend recently told me France is on the edge of a precipice. Macron is playing poker with this country and democracy. I like that analogy. And it, it does seem a very, very risky business to have sort of pushed all his chips into the centre of the table and called Marine Le Pen. However, she adds, they have two rounds and the French typically tend to vote one way the first time and another the second. I will keep my fingers crossed that this will be the case here. Uh, Dean's been in touch to say, please stop with the French words, mate. You sound like Del Boy. Creme de month? That's a bit unfair. Uh, Helen is in Mougins, a uh, lovely part of France. Helen, what can you tell us? Hello. Hello. Um, I think the thing with Macron is that he has been seen by most of the French as being arrogant and he's playing, like you said, it's a great mm. analogy, playing poker with it. What's happened, though, I think, is France is having their Brexit moment. Both the far right and the far left are very anti-immigration and that, like it or not, it strikes a chord with the French yes. very much. So both 
the far right and the coalition of the far left have done very well. And it's squeezed out the centre of Macron quite far down the, the list. So they are, I think, going to be very, very... Um, they've had a lot being in, in the heart of Europe. They see a lot of the problems with being in Europe, you know, and being part of the whole situation with emigration. That's what's riled up by the far right and the far left as being a major issue. Your, you know, your, your thoughts, and I agree with you about uh, what happened with, uh, back in the past with the Vichy government and so on and so forth, but that is so far in the, in their, the back of their minds at the moment. Yes. I don't think they really think about it. To be honest, and, 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 and you go back to 1972 for the um, evidence of them admit, admitting former Nazi collaborators into the party, and, and that is that is ancient history, I suppose, for an awful lot of people. Not yeah. least, not least yeah. the younger voters who are drawn to this sort of rhetoric. So, I, I, I mean, they are a Euro skeptic party, uh, Marine Le Pen's, but they are no longer in favour of leaving the European Union. That that is, you could describe that as one of the major Brexit benefits is that other countries have seen what happens and stepped back from that particular precipice. Mm. But I mean, that, that's, that's a policy position, but there'll be a lot of talk of renegotiating and changing, changing our deal and doing all the things that David Cameron tried to do in 2015. The problem is, from a UK point of view, that, a, that a, you know, an avowedly anti-immigration government in France... I, I, until, of yeah. course, the, t until they're in power for long enough for everybody to realise how intrinsic immigration is to economic health. That's terrible yeah. news for an anti-immigration government in the UK. Uh, you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're hardly likely to sign up to a deal to return people nope. who they don't want nope. either. Absolutely. You, you know, if this happens, you know, it's, it's very likely, mm. highly possible that she gets in, then it's probably the worst thing that could happen with regard to anybody having, um, uh, wanting to control immigration and, you know, send people back across the channel. Mm. She's not going to be allowing that anytime soon. Not that they do because now. They I mean, and, and that's a European no. Union issue because under the Dublin Convention, although we very, very rarely availed ourselves of the right to do that, we, we, we could do that. We, I mean, it was something that could be done, yeah. but we're no longer in the European Union. What do you fear most then in, in, in the context of the next, either the next two weeks or the next two years? I think um, I think that it will become more enclosed, well, fermé, as they, they call it. Mm. I think that they will have a distrust of foreigners. So, as, a, as an English woman, that's slightly scary. Um, would it extend to you? I, I, would it Would it extend to yes, you? Yes, possibly. Really? Possibly. I mean, obviously, the thing is, we're the kind of immigrants they don't mind. Yeah. Obviously. But but you, in the, the in the minds of these people, a French-born Muslim would be more of a problem mm. than a, than a foreign-born. Totally. Right. So that, that totally yeah. totally. I know. I mean, I know. You know, various sort of. Uh, you know, there's a lot in South France. You know, there's a, there's a there is across France a high Muslim population and an Arabic population. Yes, of course. And I know that they've. You know, the the, the chap that helps with our garden. I know that he said that he's noticed a lot more open sort of uh, prejudice. Even I've noticed it against the English people a bit, a little bit here and there. Mm. But I think for, if mm. you are. Uh, mainly the Arab population in France, I think they're really feeling it. So I think you're going to find there's going to be a lot of um, un unheaval distrust, um, aggression, and all that stuff coming in. Um, but I'm worried. Um, I'm worried. Uh, yeah, I can see why. Final question. How much of this is, do you think, because we've seen it here, and there's a story in the mail today that really brings this home in, in a remarkable fashion for UK politics. But if I, I, I heard one young French woman being interviewed earlier today, talking about um, mm. crime and, and security and immigration, with, with eliding all three together, and then asked whether or not it had affected her personally or she had any evidence of it. She, she said, well, no, but, but it, it is real. I have seen mm. it. And you can't help thinking that this is a, a social media phenomenon. So how much of the negative depictions, if you like, of French Muslims are based on events and how much are based on what you would describe as provocative social media, whether it's traceable back to Russia or not? I think, I think it's social media, largely. Mm. I mean, I don't, you know, we don't, we don't live particularly where we see it. To be fair, in the cities, I don't know whether there is any, but then they get poorer mm. areas in those inner city areas. So it creates a, I mean, Marseille is a very violent place. Yes, I wouldn't always want to has been. be there and, 
always has. Mm. But, you know, I think that it won't help things. I think it's going to create... The world is quite an angry place at the moment. You've yes. got people like Trump as he gets in. It's going to stoke the anger. I think people like the Pen will stoke the anger. And I think it's going to become you know, difficult everywhere. I think it's going to get very sensitive to any issue that comes up. So that's a worry. That's yes, it is. And uh, so you've articulated it very mm. well. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Helen. It is half past 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So, I mean, in terms of... The problem with immigration policy, when it is influenced by people who are not really interested in anything other than uh, we must have fewer foreigners. And I, some people struggle to accept that that's what this is built upon, but it really is. We must have fewer foreigners. Brexit's backfired horribly on, on, on that front, as it was bound to do, although perhaps not quite as horribly as it actually has. But if you've got a problem that is shared by two countries, then it can only be solved by cooperation. If, if, I mean, if you even think that it's a problem, it can only be solved by cooperation. So if you've got Keir Starmer, who has bent very far towards appeasing people who just want fewer foreigners over here, and the, the, the Front National or, or, or the National Assembly over there, I, I mean, what happens to these human beings? that have moved from one country to the other. France, I think, per capita already takes more than we do. It certainly used to do. I haven't checked recently. So the idea that we do more, that's a lie put out there by um, foreigner, by, by xenophobes. I, 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 how, how much impact would it have on the UK is a, is a question that I don't know the answer to because it, I don't see how the situation from the point of view of people who dehumanise refugees or who just want fewer foreigners regardless of whether it makes them poorer or less likely to be looked after in hospital or not. I, I don't know that, that it would get worse than it currently. I don't know. I, I don't know. But that would probably be one area where we would feel the pinch. It is 32 minutes after 11. The phone lines are open. The number you need is the same as it always is. And Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. 11.35 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, we could do a little bit of unhinged headline. We're trying to make contact with Lewis Goodall while he is... En France. I'll stop that now. You, I keep hearing Del Boy now. You've ruined it for me. I'd, I'd like to drop a little bit of French into the conversation. I'm aware it all sounds a bit 1970s cocktail party, but now every time I do it, I'm going to hear Del Boy going, creme de monf, Rodney, creme de monf. So you've spoiled that. You spoil everything. For me. I'm going to stop reading your messages soon. You just spoil everything for me. You'll be spoiling Unhinged Headline next. Although I have to tell you that there is, uh, today, there is quite a lot of competition for inclusion. Unhinged headline. Tory, this is the Telegraph, inevitably. Tory Remainers are the authors of their party's defeat. Writes a once respected historian, well, I suppose he probably still is in some quarters, called Robert Toombs. Tory Remainers are the authors of their party's defeat. And I don't think, out of the two or three contenders that I've got for you today, I don't even think that that is, from the last 24 hours, the most Unhinged headline. 11.36 is the time. Lewis Goodall is here, LBC presenter and, of course, co-host of the News Agents podcast, currently crunching a croissant in central Paris. Um, Lewis, I, I don't need to tell you why we were keen to talk to you today. It's the same reason uh, why you are in France. So, uh, shocking but not surprising? Is that how we would describe events? I, it was exactly as predicted by by the polls, James. Yes. Um, and this is, uh, and in a sense, that's the that's the sort of conclusion of a gambit which has gone wrong. We've got two leaders on both sides of the channel who have plunged their countries into snap elections, both hoping to change something during the course of the election campaign, and actually, remarkably little changing in both cases, both Sunak and, and for Macron. Yeah. Basically, the polls being entirely consistent in the run up to the election. That's what we got, which is a. A an RN or national rally victory, which is their best. They've doubled their vote share from only two years ago in the last legislative elections. And the French hard right, far right, whatever you want to call them, since the Second World War, have never got more than 20 percent of the vote. They now right. find themselves with 33 or 34 percent um, of the vote. And I think we have to ask ourselves why that is. Right. I mean, part of the reason, I think, is the normalization of that sort of politics, which has been taking place across the channel. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we recognize that in our own country. But I think we also have to say as well. Part of it is because it is perceived by many French people that the Macron experiment or the Macron presidency has failed, that he has failed to address those issues of economic dislocation and injustice, which 
to uh, propel French politics and politics everywhere. So is, is there nowhere else for that to coalesce? Because I, I know the hard left have done quite well overnight, but they don't have as cohesive an offer as the hard right. No, indeed. So what happens now, because the French have this, this, this two-round system people will be, be familiar with it, so now in a week's time there'll be another vote The sort of, in either 577 constituents is a bit like our own, and yeah. in each case, the sort of no hope of candidates, the people who've got less than 12.5%, they'll be eliminated. But then there's this sort of slightly weird political dance that has to take place between the opposition parties, in this case, to, to the hard right. Yes. Aside from these constituency, who is best placed to take them on and to uh, basically get the non-hard right vote. But of course, that's complicated in each place. It's yeah. got to be a very, I mean, it, let's take the sort of hard left coalition that, uh, or the left coalition that you mentioned. That is a disparate array of parties ranging all the way from the basic equivalent to our Labour Party, sort of mm. centre-left, social democratic, to kind of communist, basically, or you know, sort of quasi-communist actors. So that's a difficult coalition to keep together in itself. And then on top of that, you've got to get them negotiating with Macron's party, place by place. You, know, you can just imagine, this is difficult, it's hard. And even then, that assumes that voters in those places are willing to vote for the other guy, of right? Course, if you're, yes. you know, if Macron's parties are willing to vote for, or Macron's voters are willing to vote for a hard-left coalition, which is by no means guaranteed. So it's a complicated picture. Obviously, the thing that they all want to try and prevent is an absolute majority in the French Parliament for the hard right. It's really, really complicated and difficult to know whether that is possible or not before next Sunday. Well, we'll find out. And if I were to push you on what you think will happen, would you just put, sort of pretend that the phone line had gone down? <laughs> no, not, never for you, Glenn. Never. I'll stay on as long as you want. I, I would say probably that they will get close to an absolute majority, but not quite clincher. But even if they get that, then the hard right will still have a very strong claim to, to nominate the next Prime Minister of France. And yeah. then you have a, a period of, they say, of cohabitation, which is uh, when the president is from one party and their prime minister is from another. So basically you just get disarray, dislocation, and uh, just general paralysis in, the, in French politics, which uh, at a time of, of European turmoil in all sorts of ways is not ideal. This is the last thing imaginable. So uh, uh, forgive me for the simplisticness of this, simplistic nature of this question, but Macron's miscalculation even bigger than Sunak's? I think the thing is, I think what people sometimes do is that uh, a parliamentary election was almost certainly going to happen this year anyway. Oh, OK, uh, I didn't know that. So September, October, yes. It was generally right. seen basically that that parliament kind of running out of steam. So, so, I think just get home. so she's torn off the plaster, Lewis, as it were. I think that's what likes to gamble. He likes a sense of momentum, right? He likes the yeah. sense, of, sense of always being at the centre of events and controlling them rather than being buffeted by them. So you could say that he's taking a gamble. Who knows? You know, we've still got a week to go and things. That, who knows what will happen next Sunday? But yes, I mean, it was. Um, it was. Re- I think the surprise. The surprise. His party infuriated many of his party. Even his own prime minister, yeah. Gabriel Attal, didn't know that it was going to happen. And and I, I think I heard one of his own MPs describing the decision as silly elsewhere this morning as well, which um, I, I, even even the Tories haven't reached that level of dissent in the actual ranks. Lewis Goodall, thank you very much. Um, Lewis will be back on air on LBC from 10 o'clock on Thursday evening as part of our general election coverage. Um, uh, presenter, of course, and co-host of the News Agents podcast reporting live from Paris. All right. I've, I've done you the, uh, the, the, the what subject do the British public think that we all spend far too much time talking about. I've done that hook and tease. If you missed the answer, no prizes for guessing. It's transgender. Uh, here's another one for you. True or false? True or false? The Liberal Democrat leader, Ed Davey, has today done a bungee jump while shouting out an exhortation to people to vote for the Lib Dems. True, thinking of all the things he's done so far in the campaign and then... Have a little. How plausible is it that he has actually done a bungee jump? I think I said last week he'll be doing a bungee jump next. But this is today's true or false. He's done a bungee jump while exhorting people to vote for the Lib Dems. All right, true or false, and we'll we'll get you an answer to that before twelve noon. It is now eleven forty-two. Back to France. Uh, Delphine is in Cardiff. Delphine, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, Hello, Delphine. Sorry, I'm very nervous. It's only me. Uh, that's exactly why I'm nervous. Don't be <laughs> um, Carry on. So the one thing, there's a couple of things I was talking to your researcher about. The one thing I've noticed straight away this morning, going online and trying to find news about yes. um, what had happened, was the difference in the way it was shown here to what was actually being said in the French newspapers and articles online. Yes. Um, and the first thing was, here the emphasis is on Marine Le Pen. Yes. It's all about Marine Le Pen being the one that won. 
it's not actually quite what happened. Marine Le Pen is not necessarily the one that won her party dead. Um, but actually, one thing I've noticed following the lead up to the European, mm. especially, is how strong her number two is, Jordan Bardella, who is a young, um, a young politician, and he has been very good in the lead up to the European and also in obviously the lead up to the last election yesterday. He's been very, very, very good with young people. And oh, yes. I think that's where Marine Le Pen, like his, his social media presence, you were talking about social media earlier, his social media presence has been like nothing any other politician has managed to do. And I think that's where it's really scary is that the far right in France at the moment seem to have cracked the code of how to reach young people. And they've, they've reached an, aud- an audience that maybe doesn't really remember what they actually stood for, what, what the history of the party is. Uh, well, all, all the detoxification has been successful. Whether it is sincere or not is a different conversation, isn't it? But the yeah. But it could have been, I mean, would they accept, there aren't any Nazi collaborators left, I don't imagine, in France, but would they accept Nazi collaborators now? Or the answer could be no to that question, albeit that her father was you would hope. was happy to. The, the thing that fascinates me most about all of this far-right renaissance is how much of it seems to be derived from social media. I, I, I get exposed to quite a lot of these accounts um, for fairly obvious reasons, but they're full of sort of AI-generated images of, of mm-hmm. people in traditionally um, Arabic or Muslim garb sort of being marched past the Eiffel Tower and the British equivalent yeah. has got kind of spitfires in the background. And the perception, if you look at these accounts is that everybody foreign is a criminal, or certainly every asylum seeker or every refugee or every Muslim is a criminal, and they'll find an example of someone committing a crime and extrapolate from one crime that a million people of a similar ethnicity or religion must also be criminals. And that works. I I mean, you know, we can sit here being all educated and, and, and progressive and think that can't possibly work, but it really works. And I think it's possibly working even more in France because of, I guess the more obvious colonial history from um, from Muslim countries, from Arab countries, than than it works here. So the number of people who think that they need the Front National to to clamp down on crimes that they have no personal experience of, but which they keep seeing reflected on their social media algorithms. I, I think a lot of it comes from that. I mean, this morning alone, most of looking at um, on going on Twitter or. Yes. Um, looking, trying to find information about what happened to Paris in, in Paris or in France. Most of my feed was filled in with um, tweets in English yes. um, showing a supposed riot from the far left as a response to the election. Which hadn't happened. And when I went on French News and I did a lot of digging this morning to try yeah. and actually find out, I realized that actually there was... There was a, a couple of people in the street. There was, yes, some people had, had turned around a few bins, but mm. it was nowhere near as bad as what was being portrayed. And there was no evidence whatsoever that it was the far left. Yeah. And, and I, so, I saw some footage of, of shops being boarded up as a similar proof of, of far left violence being being in the offing without, you know, the far left didn't do as badly as, as Emmanuel Macron yesterday. It's a, it's a weird one. How worried are you? I, I mean, you're clearly dual national or at least in in, 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 in spirit you're dual national how worried okay. are you about what's happening yes. in France? um so I, i'm i'm fully french despite the welsh accent yes. here a bit too long uh, but i'm fully french that. and and i'm really worried about about this because it's the second time now that we came very 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 close yeah. to what well, more than second time but i remember as far as 2002 where her father marine le pen's father went to the second round of the presidential election and France had to do faire barrage to do a blockade yes, that's right. where yes. everybody had to vote for Jacques Chirac at the time. And that is still, I, I was young then, but that was my rite of passage protest where everybody went out in the street and we all protested to not have the far right. And I feel like we've been stuck there since 2002 where every election the far right is doing well, but in a way, they're just filling in the vacuum. Uh, and that because vacuum the gets, left gets is bigger. Gone. Yes. The left is gone. Macron has, Macron has completely overestimated, I think, um, what his party represents in France. 
And yeah. I think he he kind of filled in a big gap in the middle, pretending to come from the left because mm. he's actually out of the last Parti Socialiste. He kind of tried to please everybody by being a bit left, a bit centre, a bit right, more right, some would say. And I think he's completely overestimated the pull that he had. Okay, so there's a yeah, that would there's a hubristic arrogance there then, which is perhaps a bit there reminiscent is. of David Cameron. Uh, in in 2015, do you know? Silly mm-hmm. question. Final question. Do you know who Jan Molby is, and do you know why I think of him when I hear your voice? <laughs> no, I don't know who he is. So Jan Molby was a Danish footballer who played for Liverpool and then moved to Kidderminster to manage our football club, and somehow managed, contrived, during his time in Kidderminster to have an accent that betrayed his Danish roots, his Liverpudlian playing experience, and his time as manager of Kidderminster Harriers. And I don't know why, but I'm always <laughs> utterly charmed by, by accents that display more than one route. And, uh, and you, as you said yourself, Delphine, you've got one of those. Yes. yes. It's, it's a lovely thing. Thank you so much. It's 11.49. It's 11.51. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. OK, clever clogs. It turns out that the answer to my question about whether or not it was true or false that Ed Davey had today undertaken a bungee jump uh, while shouting vote Lib Dem had already appeared on the news bulletin, uh, which I was uh, unaware of because I was very busy doing something else during the last news bulletin. So I don't know that that is now going to work as a tension-building exercise in Radio Magic because you know that it's true because it was on our own news. So let's pretend that bit never happened and instead play a different game. Can you guess what Ed Davey is doing (laughs) in this clip from Sky News? Um, I just kind of pause you there. Because believe it or not, that's Ed Davey, Paddy. Um, I'm not going to get you to... Yeah, well, he's got the handbrake off, hasn't he? Yeah, well, he's certainly going for it. I mean, (laughs) kind of showing what... uh, Gareth Southgate should do, which is be a bit bold and a bit brave. Have we got the bit? Is there any without a, a, a commentary on it? I just want to hear the, the noise of the leader of the Liberal Democrats jumping off a crane with elastic bands attached to him three days before a general election campaign. I mean, say what you like. He's it's, it's found a way of attracting attention that is often denied the leader of the uh, uh, potential opposition in Parliament if some of the polls are to be believed. I'm told also, I don't know if this counts as breaking news or not, I'm told also that the lead, the driver of the Liberal Democrats campaign bus has now also done a bungee jump. That's, that's some breaking news for you. The leader, the driver, I beg your pardon, of the Liberal Democrats campaign group has also done a bungee jump. Um, I, we may have a look at the, or have a listen to the un, uncommentated sound of Ed Davey jumping off a crane shortly. 11.54 is the time. In the next hour, we're going to do which politicians would you most like to jump off a crane? I'm joking. Uh, let's go back to France. James is in Brittany. James, what would you like to say? Hello. Well, just before that, I was I was just picturing Jacob Rees-Mogg doing a bungee jump, and to be honest, I'd, I'd be prepared to vote Tory if I could see him. How, would, how could you tell... Where the elasticated cord ended and Jacob <laughs> Rees Mogg began. Oh, oh, God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carry anyway, on, that's sense. not why I called. No, I didn't think um, it was. I, I heard earlier on you were, you were saying, you know, how is it that France, having had, uh, um, uh, having lived under a Nazi occupation, yes. uh, could, and, and I, yes, I, I get what you mean, but uh, that's ancient history, I right. think, for younger people. And particularly, as a few people have said today, um, uh, in particular, um, uh, Lewis uh, Goodall, yes. uh, they have been brilliant at detoxifying. The French word is de, 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 de No, I can't say it. No, don't de, worry, de, mate. Just stick with detoxify. Yeah, they've de, 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 anyway. And, uh, Sanitized. Yeah, and, and they, I was watching, my, my partner lives in Paris, recently mm. retired. She has a tiny pension. Mm. Her gas bills are massive. She lives in an area where she sometimes feels unsafe, okay. and it's an area with high immigration. Mm. I, I don't think she needs to feel unsafe, but she does. Yeah. We were watching Baldella being interviewed. This is the man week. who would be prime minister if they secured the a, 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 a parliamentary minister. majority. Yes, and he... and. 
as he was talking, I said nothing, but I could just imagine, yeah, he's hitting all of the right buttons mm. for my partner. Uh. And I don't think that she would vote because she still knows that the Front National always was and always will be uh, a racist party. But, you know, they're going to bring gas prices down. They're they say they say they are. I mean, uh, yeah. they, they yeah. say they are. Exactly. Um, but um, they, they, I, I so is the populism day, with a side order of racism then? Well, yes. But Sounds they, familiar. I know, or racism with I know, a side and, order and, of populism. Yeah, I know it's... And ultimately, I mean, they, they do remind me very, very much of Reform UK. Yes. And, uh, you know, but that's right. So they, they can talk about everything, but the answer to everything is less immigration. Talk less about immigration, less talk immigration. About health, well, well about it's a little bit more there, isn't it? Because you've got this... Well, I heard one uh, interviewee this morning describing the Islamophobie that he has encountered yeah. increasingly as a, a, a taxi Definitely. driver working in the south of France. But the, the French citizen who, for example, wears a headscarf yeah. is going to be in the firing line in, in the event of yeah. these characters getting power. Yeah, and, and I think to understand this, it's the, the, there's, uh, well, the, the, the French secularism, a, a, you know, a law was passed over 100 years ago to say there is no, there's a complete separation between church and state, uh, which is fair enough, but that's now been reinterpreted to say uh, kids going to school cannot wear yeah. any visible, exterior visible signs of their religion. Uh, so and the headscarf, arguably, although there's headscarf. no mention of it in the Quran, it's clear what it is. What it is designed to achieve. Exactly. Shall I have a go at that yeah. word? Shall I have a go at that word? De, de, yeah, no, it's my go now. You've had your turn. You've fluffed it, James. You've blown <laughs> it, mate. Okay, I'm going to have a go. You ready? Yep. De diabolisation. De diabolisation. Voilà, oui. bravo. Merci beaucoup. Bravo. On y arrive. Yeah. 11.57 is the time. There you go. Stick that in your Del Boy and smoke it. Um, eh, thank you, James. Back to France. Sebastian is in Massy. Sebastian, what would you like to say? Hi there. Good morning, James. Nice Hello. to speak to you again. Likewise. Um, so, so on the question of how they get to where they are, where, how we got to where we are, um, you have to remember that Macron, as one of your previous callers said, came technically out of the left. He was yeah. a protégé of Hollande when Hollande was uh, president. He's back, isn't um, he, probably? He's back, yeah. Mm. Uh, but he uh, gouged out a centre space by basically destroying the traditional centre-left in his first term. Of course, and yes. then eating up the traditional centre-right in his second term. Yes. The Republican Party is, is basically no more. Um, so the, what's been more fringy parts of the Republican Party has moved towards uh, the Le Pen Party. Um, and one of the ways that the Le Pen Party has managed to claw its way to being at the foot of power as it is now is that they have stayed solid, unchanging, and focused on their, uh, you like them or not, their policies yeah. for the last 30 years whilst undertaking this program of dédiabilisation. Um, well now, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, which means, and, and, and traditionally in France, uh, political parties, uh, so the, the left was always very sort of policy based, very sort of philosophy based, yeah, rather yeah, than okay. having a strong it's a hollowing out else. you're describing, aren't you? A hollowing yeah. out. Absolutely. And that, that leaves a vacuum into which, uh, yeah, that means leaves a vacuum into which that traditional, I've always said 15 to 20 or 10 to 20 percent of a population is always yep. susceptible to this kind of populism yep. crossed with, ra with, 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 with racism. And then that, the, the bigger the vacuum, the bigger the increase in, so, in, in the yeah, appeal. Yeah, so, so Le Pen, by staying solid, mm. solid to their base, solid to their ideas, and solid to their philosophy, have basically sat and squatted like a big toad in the right position. God. Um, whereas everyone else sort of fragmented around them. How interesting. How interesting. How this affects me personally, yes. because I'm, I'm French and British, I'm dual national. Yes. Um, my wife is from Côte d'Ivoire, and right. my son, so he has basically triple national. He's got a British passport, he's got a French passport, he could have a Ivoirian, but wow. I mean, he's only six now, yeah. but in years to come, how is he going to be seen? I'm very worried about the the future for him because you're because um, he's mixed race and your wife is black. He's exactly yes, exactly, and he's mixed race. I mean, he's, he's black, but he's also um, French, and yet not in the eyes. I think you're telling me not 
properly French, to use a phrase, whatever it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll probably be considered, you know, not French enough. Because there was a um, Nigel Farage advisor last week, still employed, um, using the phrase proper English. And, you know, I don't think there are many interpretations of what they mean when they say things like that. And that's what that's what you're worried about. I, I saw some some nitwit on, uh, on uh, YouTube yeah. saying uh, Europe is a fundamentally or historically has always been a white... Uh, yeah. white... Uh, right. continent for thousands of years and you just go back and say, actually no it hasn't not even that far back yeah you can um, prove anything with facts you can prove anything with facts no. <laughs> and history you prove anything with history thank you I, I hope your troubles or rather i hope your worries prove to be unfounded but of course the rise of this sort of rhetoric is is commonplace um uh, despite this well anyway uh, it's one minute after 12. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Ned David there uh, on a bungee jump. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The time now is five minutes after 12. And I want to turn your... Actually, I'll give you some hook and teasers for this hour. I've got the Daily Mail thing. Ollie's been in touch from Brixton. He says, digital post-it note in capital letters. Don't forget the Daily Mail story. I won't forget the Daily Mail story. It is for those of us who have derived very little pleasure from being proved completely right about Brexit. It opens an entire new dimension to the hypocrisy of the biggest cheerleader for that ludicrous act of national self-harm. And and I can't quite believe what I've read this morning. It's relevant to the looming general election as well. Um, so I will definitely tell you that. But I've got... I've got so, so Eleanor t- told me off a minute ago for always asking questions to which you already know the answer. I think she's underestimating the magic of radio on, on these because it, it creates a different psychological dynamic. But here is a double header of, of guess the answer to this question. So which party has been accused of using a song hijacked by the far right on one of their campaign videos? Um, I, I think they've now been forced to remove it. But it, uh, So which party used a song that's been banned across Europe for its far-right connotations? Okay, that's, that's question number one. And question number two is a university student group from which party has been forced to apologise after its members sang and danced to a Nazi song at a black tie event? So this is a double header, and I'll give you a clue. It's got different answers, okay? It's not the same answer. So a student group from which political party has been forced to apologise after its members sang and danced to a Nazi song? They they asked the DJ to put on a Nazi song at a black tie event. And the second question is, which party has used a song banned across Europe for its far-right connotations in a campaign video all right so there's two little hooks and teasers for you there which i will endeavor not to forget before one o'clock today so here's something i've been thinking uh, a lot about uh, in the last couple of weeks because we've talked a lot about private education actually that wasn't on sarah's list was it of labor policy proposals or or manifesto uh, contents i've been thinking a lot about the things i don't know because i went to boarding school Uh, Boarding school being a very particular example of the private school. Things I don't understand because I went to private school. It's emerged a lot in the last few weeks that there is a gulf of experience between us and and, uh, whether you're going to shrink that gulf by bringing in VAT on school fees, only time will tell. Personally, I don't think the numbers... I think it's going to raise a lot of money, well, some money for the Labour Party, but I don't think it's going to affect... Um, sign up rates at schools so it won't have done anything actually to, to, to reduce inequality it will just have raised some money which can then be spent hopefully on reducing inequality by improving state schools but 
it struck me that I have got a relatively... I, I, looking at Sunak is part of this as well. You, you look at that Winchester, Oxford, Goldman Sachs hedge fund. Stanford. Winchester, Oxford, Stanford, Goldman Sachs hedge fund. And the accusation that he cannot begin to imagine what it's like to be normal, I think, holds some weight. And the simple act of attending a school like mine or like his, or a lesser, I don't want to say that, a cheaper private school, which everyone keeps telling, oh, it's not all about eating, you know, some people do, 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 which is fine when they're busy getting out their tiny violins um, while denying the existence of genuine poverty or the necessity of food banks in this country. So I've been thinking about things that I have possibly reacted wrongly to as a consequence of my own experiences. And I've come up with a really odd example, partly as a result of a story that's in the news this morning. I have no idea what a youth club is. And whenever we've talked about knife crime in this, on this programme, whenever we've talked about uh, the, the prevalence of knife crime among poorer communities and uh, the disproportionate presence of, of ethnic minority families or black children, black boys in particular, in that demographic, um, which is the reason why, of course, the, there's a disproportionate incidence of, of knife crime among those kids. I've often heard the phrase youth club. I've often been told that one of the reasons why gang culture has taken hold in parts of town and why gang culture leads to knife crime is because they've got nothing else to do. And one of the great examples of something that they would once have been able to do that's always given. Sorry, I've got a little frog in my throat. Bear with me for one moment. There we go. <clears throat> One of the things that's always offered up is youth clubs. And to my embarrassment, I noticed this morning reading this story that I've always had, and please don't hate me for this, I've always actually greeted that claim with a bit of scepticism. Even though it's been made by people with proper experience and indeed proper evidence of the phenomenon, because I know nothing about it, I've never encountered a youth club in my life. I mean, how could I? given that I was at boarding school from the age of 10, I've always had a subconscious scepticism when people have mentioned youth clubs. I've, I've always, I've not, I don't think articulated it out loud, possibly I did back in the day. Oh, I see, so, so they're all going to stop stabbing each other, are they, because they're playing crossfire or table tennis. Do you see how easy it is to go to that place? I've probably heard other people do it, and I may have been a little bit more susceptible than I hope I usually am to the, to the lazy right-wing reflex, the knee-jerk response, which is largely built upon the idea that people are intrinsically bad, particularly in the case of knife crime and stop and search, young black lads are, oh no, they're intrinsically bad. That's where the idea comes from. Oh yeah, they're all going to stop stabbing each other if they're playing table tennis, are they? But actually, the, the reason why I would be susceptible to that lazy racist reflex is because I am sceptical about youth clubs. Or rather, I am ignorant about youth clubs. I, I, fa I, found, I found the idea implausible. But when you think about it, what would you rather do in the evening? Hang around at a bus stop, picking a fight with people from a different postcode? Or be warm and dry, watching telly, playing games, playing table tennis? playing table football. I don't know. I, do, do you see what I mean? And I, I, some days, it's mad that I've been doing this job for 20 years, and sometimes I find myself approaching territory that we've explored together on a million different occasions and realising, 20 years in, realising that I've been doing it with my sort of with my brain cells tied together. I've been doing it with my metaphorical hands behind my back. I've been approaching the conversation about knife crime with a completely irrational prejudice about youth clubs. And the reason why I realised that today is some research that shows, published today, that young people are crying out for a return of youth clubs. 75% of 16 to 19-year-olds have been affected by... Tory cuts to this provision, to this service. More than half of people in their late teens are specifically calling for more youth work that offers fun 
older teenagers, believe it or not, hankering for more jollity. Uh, it's been carried out by the National Youth Agency, who find that one in ten say they have zero options to access youth work. So young people crying out for youth clubs and evidence of cuts leaving 75% of 16 to 19 year olds frozen out of contact with youth workers, a deep and widespread desire for more fun and clear evidence that what is wanted is no longer there. So this is one of those days where I get to learn from you. I, I get to change my approach to a subject by learning from your life, okay? And I just want to know what difference they made to you. I, do you know, please don't mock me, but I don't know what they are like either. If you go to boarding school, I can tell you something you don't know now, unless you went to a school like mine. If you go to boarding school, then there are clubs, after school clubs I know you get that at state schools as well but you, you you are at a youth club if you're at a boarding school you're with your mates all the time you're in a warm and dry place you can watch the telly together you can play table tennis you can join the Dungeons and Dragons club or the or the chess club or the computer club There's, you can you know it's a constant really uh, uh, engagement you're constantly engaged if you want to be and still some of us end up getting into trouble. Of course, it's, it's inevitable, but the numbers are relatively negligible in the great scheme of things. I don't know what a youth club is like, and I don't know what sort of hole it leaves in a community, but you do. So you're going to phone me and you're going to tell me. And in the context of knife crime, we need to nod, don't we, towards the almost, I'd have thought, irrefutable observation that the more constructive and positive engagement young people have available, the less likely they are to fall into destructive and negative engagements with both each other and society at large. So I can't, I can't believe that. I'm really sorry that I've not clocked this before. Somewhere in the back of my mind, you say youth club, I say do me a favour. And yet when you read this double statistic that the, the percentage of young people that really really want a return of youth clubs and the scale of the cuts that the sector has endured since david cameron became prime minister in 2010 i, I mean it's self-evident isn't it it's bloody obvious that this must be a, a, a very real and necessary phenomenon it's estimated that about a billion pounds a year is the minimum necessary to start fixing things. And obviously, crisis-hit councils are not going to be able to find that kind of money, and they may be forced to make even bigger cuts to funding, regardless of who wins the general election on Thursday. So so what difference do youth, youth clubs make? And the best way to answer that question is by telling me what difference they made to you. But And I don't apologise for this, actually. We're all ignorant of some things, aren't we, about each other's existences. What do you do there? What are they like? What are they like and why are they so effective at keeping young people off on the straight and narrow, if you like? 12.17 is the time. 0345-6060973 uh, is the number you need. You know what I've realised? Part of the problem with this is this idea that we're all different when actually we're all the same. So... Of course, youth clubs make sense. What would you rather do? That's what it is. Private school, state school, comprehensive school, public school, black, white, uh, poor, rich, doesn't matter. If you're young and you're bored, you're less likely to get into trouble if you've got something good to do, right? It's 12.18. 20 minutes after 12 is the time. Youth clubs. Um, if you missed the introduction, you can rewind it on Global Player and listen again because I want to crack on with the calls. Rob's in Ashington in Northumberland. Rob, what made you pick up the phone? Just the, the whole conversation around youth work, James, it's, it's been missed. It's something that's been missing from this election campaign. It's something mm. that over the past decade or so has just been ripped out of our community. Why are they so good? And what's your connection with them? So I, I work for a, a youth organisation up in Ashington and we struggle on a daily basis to deliver services to young people because we just don't have access to youth works anymore. The, the profession has just been compounded with, with with lack of investment where now youth work is seen as something that's like you said earlier on a game of table tennis it isn't seen for what it is and it's about giving young people 
guidance and support and, and an opportunity to be with a safe adult that's going to help them make better decisions and, and think more positive about their, their kind of prospects in life. When did the compounding begin? Well, 14 years ago. Well, I mean, it is that simple. I'm conscious of, of, of sometimes being a bit lazy myself in analyses of these kind of things, but it is all about austerity, is it? Another austerity Absolutely. factor. Yeah, I mean, just over the last 12 to 14 years, the... the, the as you said with the NYA report, money is just ripped out of the profession. There isn't that support. Northumberland has no youth services paid for by local authority anymore. And there's an onus on the charity sector to come forward and, and fill that gap. And we try every single day and we try and find the funding and it's not there. Uh, the, the, I suppose, other question I need to ask you is about the relationship between it not being there and the increased likelihood of, of young people getting into into bother. Well, we've seen it with, with COVID happening, although, well, it seems years ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Young people didn't have access to trusted adults during that whole period, and that's changed behaviours just in that short period of time. The impact of that has been huge. And, and, the, and the, the, have. the difference between a youth worker and a, and a teacher or a parent, tell me a bit about yeah. that as well, if you can. Well, you know, parents and teachers are really important in life. My wife's a teacher and, yeah, and she does her best for young people, but it's a different relationship. It's a it's a, a relationship that's based on authority to some degree. Youth workers are a, they're not a friend, but they're a trusted adult that's there to give young people support. Someone and, at the door, is that? No, sorry, no, no, just <laughs> phone. Right, um, obviously, someone's heard me online. Um, but it's an opportunity for someone to talk to them that can be trusted and, and, and yes we've got safeguarding oh, things there in what? place. The more I listen to you the more I wonder whether this is actually part of, a, of, of, of another example of what happens when politicians were all privately educated. It is isn't it? Maybe. It, Maybe no, just, yeah. it just I, is. Yeah, I, I mean you, you're being diplomatic but because everything you're saying to me is self-evident but if you were saying it to Rishi Sunak or David Cameron they wouldn't know what you were talking about because so I'm so terribly sorry we, we get all that at school Rob more power to your elbow I'm, I'm pointing something out now not picking you up on it because I did exactly the same thing earlier in the program during Covid I said Covid's still happening Covid's coming back with a, with a bit of a vengeance as a new strain called flirt but, but that's our language there Rob and I both saying today during what we mean is during lockdown COVID is still, I've got to be careful about that. So if you catch me doing it again, let me know. And I will, uh, I will endeavour to, to, to be better. But crikey, that, that's a powerful contribution from Rob. And I really, think, um, I really think that point about private schools and politicians is absolutely key. And, and Starmer, of course, went to a, a, a grammar school that became a private school, although he, he, his parents never paid fees. That would have a similar ethos and structure to a public school or a private school. So the activities, the engagement that the boys in the school could have outside of the normal curriculum would be huge. And it means you don't appreciate the importance of the kind of organisation that, um, that Rob works for. Kaylee is in Borowash in Derbyshire. Kaylee, what would you like to say? Hi. Uh, Hello, yeah, Kaylee. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the youth club that we've got in Borowash and how much I love it. Go on. Um, we do a lot of conflict resolution with oh, the wow. kids. Oh, wow. Really? Um, so, yeah. Um, are you, what are you? Are you a social worker? A youth worker? A social worker? So a bit of both? Yeah, I've, I've just qualified as a social worker. I'm, I'm not um, officially registered yet, so right. I can't actually call myself that. But, um, but you work yeah, in the youth club. You volunteer in the, the youth club. For years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm the safeguarding lead at the moment. Um, all the kids that are that come to us, they're they're local kids. They start from sort of year five up. There's no upward limit. Um, we have kids with different um, cognitive abilities, different right. socioeconomic statuses. Um, if they can't afford to pay the one pound fee, they just walk straight in. Yeah. It's, we're trying to remove as many barriers as possible. Um, and but I think with the conflict resolution, I know we we're talking. You're talking yes. about sort of gang stuff um a lot of the kids when they do argue with people a lot of the arguments tend to be online right. they struggle to know how to de-escalate face to face yes um there's a lot of machismo especially with you know a bit of a generalization but teenage lads of course um so having a physical person there to sit between them or sit them down together and go right okay well this can't carry on Good so Lord. how do we how do we move forward? And it's just those basic things that we're missing in schools because 
it's, we're pushing more and more towards the academic stuff and all the pastoral support has just disappeared over the last 10 years. So we need it more um, than and, ever and there's less of it yeah. than ever before. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we used to get free um, use of the local youth centre, well, the, the, the community Com- centre. Yeah. And, and this year they've started charging us because they can't afford to keep the place open without charging us, which means we've had to look at where we generate that money from and the last thing we want to do is increase the fees but you know, where, where where you, the you money's got to it? come from somewhere that, well thank you for what you do I, in fact I, that's not me saying that that's sarah who's texted to say thank you to this caller as a child who grew up in care social workers are massively undervalued children in care of course will be in your um uh, in your youth center as well there's no that, that's one of the places they'll be able to go um what so what funds you now is it still coming from the council but just not enough of it um no we i don't think we get anything from the council so you're fundraising we've got somebody yeah we're constantly fundraising we do the the coin collection thing at like the supermarkets um we we apply for random bits of funding here there and everywhere um we've we've actually managed to negotiate with the the people who run the community centre that we can use it for free over the summer holidays because um, during those six weeks we like to put food on for the kids who obviously aren't going to have access to, to meals every day at home. At least we know that they can have a hot meal that, when they come to so us. healthy for the kids that do, who do have access to meals at home as well to, to know what life is like yeah. for other people, like a proper sort of melting pot, a proper community centre for, but, 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 but for young people and it wouldn't exist without volunteers like you, Kaylee. It's incredible what you do. It really is. 28 minutes after... 12 is a time Richard would understand the importance of your volunteering. He writes, I'm 55, James, and I grew up in Handsworth in Birmingham. I went to a youth club in Perry Bar. That's me guessing at roughly where Richard's accent sits as a consequence of his childhood. And this was really good because kids from different areas going to different schools would be making friends and not not fighting, not the tribal fighting that goes on today. Um, I, 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 I can't believe how obvious this is and how foolish I've been for the last God knows how long in not taking the suggestion seriously whenever we've had conversations about gang culture or knife crime. Uh, but of course, it's about much more than that. Sam's in Exeter. Sam, what would you like to say? Oh, hello. Um, yes, I've, I've been waiting for you to, to kind of bring this subject up for ages. Well, you could have um, flipping suggested it, mate. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfectly interactive medium. Listen, I've been on Sheila Fogarty's programme talking about knife crime and um, Sangeeta's programme, so now I'm on yours. Well, I've um, talked a lot about knife crime over the years. I just yes. haven't talked properly about the role that youth clubs play. Mm-hmm. So go ahead, Definitely. fill your boots. So I, I um, qualified as a youth worker, a professional youth worker in 2011. And, you know, once I'd qualified, I was running a, running a youth club in, in Sheffield. And there was this kid that came into the youth club. And I got word one week that he might be carrying a knife. Okay. And so I went and spoke to him about it. He was carrying a knife, confiscated it asked him to leave the youth centre, but with the provi- but with the proviso that he came back next week. Yeah. Came back next week, asked him again, same thing happened. W- week after, same thing happened. By the fifth week, I asked him again, and he said, no, I haven't got a knife on me. And the ability of me to be able to give him that positive praise and reinforcement was invaluable for that child. Now, that that is one of the critical aspects of youth workers. It's not only building the relationship with child, but it's reinforcing that positive relationship. You know, um, and that's been, different from an authority figure. Then, even though you were mm-hmm. acting authoritatively, you weren't yeah. an authority figure. You're somewhere in between, yes. teacher and yes. friend. There's no there's no power imbalance. Uh, so it's about you, you know the, the the critical you know kind of phrase is it's informed choice. So it's giving a child, a teenager, all the information about what they're doing, and then allowing them to make those choices. And if that that kid then chose not to bring that knife into the youth club again, yeah. not to even carry a knife out in the community, that's the power of it. You know, when when you're on the outside looking in, what you, what what people see is a vast amount of children going into a place and playing pool and there's lots of noise and it might be a bit chaotic. But the reality is for a youth worker such as myself, mm. it's about the relationships behind that. So playing of pool, course. for example, yeah. is the conduit to the conversation. Of course it is. You know, 
It's like a pub. Key. It's like a pub, and, and, and the it's friendships and the and the relationships that you can have in a, any social situation, but with this added dimension of of maturity being there for the benefit of immaturity. So, like you say, it, it, eventually he made that decision himself. He wasn't coerced into it or punished into it. I'd, thank you, Sam, uh, and I apologise for not getting around to this a little sooner. Twelve thirty one is the time, and Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. 12.34 is the time. This one got me. Youth clubs, and this is from a pal of mine, actually, not, 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 just a, um, not just an inbox one. Youth clubs are brilliant. I went to the one on our estate every night, Monday to Friday, after my dad died. From the age of 13 up until I learnt to drive and could buy a car with my paper round money. Table tennis, badminton, pool, space invaders, E.T. on a pirate video. I don't know what Dixie is. I, I, I grew up in Warrington, I think. Is Dixie a thing? Would I know it by a different name? Uh, I can still be any of my kids, nieces, nephews, in-laws, son-in-law at table tennis. Thanks to that place. It looked like a cross between a library, a church hall and a small cinema. And it's funny you should say that because I, I, this came in at the same time. James, you should go to the biggest youth club in the UK, the Isleworth Explorers, and see the great work that they do. And I drove past it yesterday. I actually clocked it yesterday. It's next to the swimming pool on um, on the well, very near my house, very near where I live, next to the library um, in Isleworth. And and I did I did clock the sign and think, what is that all about then? And, and now I know. And it looks a bit like a, a cross between a library, a church hall and a small cinema. Um, we're talking about youth clubs and kind of wondering why we haven't talked about them more because the role that they play in society is obvious, which leads me to my hobby horse. I bet this is a private education thing. There's no way. Uh, you know the Alexis Sale line about austerity? Well, one of my favourite lines from one of my favourite comedians. Well, austerity, uh, George Osborne and David Cameron's austerity was built upon the idea that the global financial crisis of 2008 was caused there by there being too many libraries in Wolverhampton. You, they, they wouldn't have shut down stuff. Maybe I'm being too kind, in which case you're, you're welcome to say, James, you're being too kind again. But they wouldn't have shut down some of this stuff if they'd understood the value of it. And youth clubs have got to be, youth clubs and sure start centres, which when you think about it are the same thing, except for children of different ages and you don't take your mum with you or your dad to the to the youth club. They would not, and I don't think you could have and I'm speaking from a position of guilt here, I don't think you could have failed to appreciate the importance of youth clubs and sure start centres if you'd had experience of them. So youth clubs, you would have had to have had experience of as a youth. And if you were at a fee-paying school, certainly if you were at a public school or a boarding school, you would not have experience of them. Therefore, you could sign off on the abolition or the closure of them. Paul's in Colchester. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, I've actually been Hello. waiting for you. Like, like your previous call, I've been waiting for you to talk about this for, for a long time. I'm sorry. Um, and I was very excited when you did. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I attended many youth clubs when I was younger. Uh, I'm, I'm now 31. Yeah. Um, my father has recently been made redundant from Thurrock Council mm. um, as a youth worker because of the obvious uh, the problems that were going on at the, at the Thurrock Council. Oh, of course, yes. Um, and I can't tell you the, the, the impact that that had on my life and the impact it's now had on the community now that those, the youth services are gone. It's not just about the youth clubs. It's about the youth services as a whole. Um, the, the cuts have absolutely ripped the guts out of the youth services and you can really see the impact just How? driving around the streets. You, you'd we say that, just see the groups of people who could be somewhere and are not. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I know you were you'd be slightly flippant about, uh, about you know, playing table tennis. But no, I'm not anymore. I used to... No, I'm somewhere. not anymore. I'm not anymore. Especially not... Look, I'm reading that message off my mate about losing his dad when he was 13 and this is where he went every night, you know? Exactly, yeah. And, and, and I... I was very fortunate with my family and my life, but I met people at these youth clubs who, who weren't as fortunate as me. Of and, course. Um, my father used, used me as a sort of, uh, I think they called it a peer mentor. Okay. You know, rather than when we went on excursions or residentials or whatever, rather than an adult mm. sort of saying, oh, don't do that. Because uh, I was their age and my father brought me up in a certain way, he'd say to me, do me a favour, just get them to, you know, to, to just have a word, quiet word in their ear, because it sounded better coming from a peer. Did. Of course it did. Um, 
and, and as you said before, you mix, it's a melting pot. You mix with people you probably wouldn't normally mix with. In, in Thurrock, there's, there's no there's downside at all. Issues. There's no downside at all to it. Do you? There really isn't. Do, do, do you think there's anything? I'm sorry to labour the point, but you know it's one of my pet subjects. You could, Absolutely. You, they wouldn't have done this if they'd had proper knowledge and understanding of it. They wouldn't have done 100%. this. 100%. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Because it's, it's one no of those things. Anyone that has experience with yeah. youth, youth services and understands the good work they do would, would do this. It's disgusting what they're doing. So you save a few quid today, but it actually, as with so many of the austerity-based decisions, is going to cost society a hell of a lot more moving forward. In the long term, oh. it will cost a hell of a lot more than it saves in the short term because of the consequences of what we're talking about. Well, we're now seeing, we start, well, I say starting, we are seeing the the, the consequences of the cuts that happened, yeah. you know, and, and as your first caller said, this started 14 years ago. This is almost immediate. You know, I saw it in my father. I mean, I was I, I went on to join the army and, right. and things, but I saw it with my father and who he was having real struggles yeah. and moral struggles about where they spend the money. Because they haven't got enough of it you to do. You could hear Rob. I don't do. know if you heard the first caller who, who, who still works in the sector, and you could hear the I strain did, actually when he was talking about fundraising, because that becomes that takes up bandwidth that would previously, and this is for the ones that are still open or, 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 or the or the workers that are still in the sector. It's taking up bandwidth that would once have been dedicated a hundred percent to the welfare of the children of the young people. Massively, and, and I can tell you as well from experience, these people, uh, these youth workers, don't go into the job for money no for sure they do it for the love and, and for the and, and for the fact they want to give back to the communities my I, I can't tell you how many times my dad came home at stress to his eyeballs mm. um and and you know he spent a lot of, and to be honest and i have absolutely no problem with this he spent a lot more time with his young people and his young adults than he did with maybe us at a time until you were there, unless you were at... Yeah, well, well you yeah, said it. I'm just trying to talk you out of your analysis of your own childhood. Not even, <laughs> not even I'm that daft. No. But he gave us... I'm not saying that in a bad way. He no, gave I understand. Us, he knew we had the tools to, to, to survive, and, and other people needed, needed him more than we did at the time. And that's absolutely not a bad oh, thing. Oh, a beautiful thing um, to say. And, and, you know, you obviously had a strong sense of public service as well, given that you... Went on to join the army. I, ah, oh dear. I can, you know, I, I don't bridle. That would be completely the wrong word. But to have two people from within that world, one son of a youth worker, one youth worker, all, all saying we should have talked about this sooner. I, 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 I get it. And I've, and I've explained why we didn't, because I had that subconscious reflex. Don't be daft. They're not going to stop stabbing each other if they're playing table tennis. But th that, that is born of ignorance of the reality. And that's why I think that the politicians who brought about this went to schools like mine. That's why I think it's relevant. 12.42 is the time. Rob's in Bournemouth. Rob, what would you like to say? James, I'm absolutely delighted you've chosen to talk about youth club today. I wanted to talk about the cadet forces and specifically the RAF air cadets. So I was a, <laughs> a, an air cadet myself between 2000 and 2005. I'm, I'm only um, giggling because I was an air cadet as well. But I, I was, I, no, I was appalling. I, I, in fact, Wing Commander Biddy, Wing Commander Biddy described me as the most unfortunate cadet he'd had the misfortune of encountering in 20 years as school's liaison officer. But at a school like mine, it didn't matter for the reasons that we've already yeah. discussed. To you, it was clearly I mean, I a life changer. Yeah, so for me, this absolutely was a life changer. I mean, I think this is something that is very much accessible right here, right now. I think it's one of the best kept secrets in the country. Yeah. Um, there are about 45,000 air cadets in the country. I, I continue to volunteer with them as a, a cadet adult volunteer, yeah. um, which I, I think is, is one of the most uh, brilliant things that you, you can do. Um, in terms of what does that cost, cost the country? It costs the country about £18 million pounds a year. Um, for that, you've got 45,000 air cadets plus all of the adult volunteers volunteers, um, things I've had access to, so Duke of Edinburgh, uh, learning to fly aeroplanes, um, Chipmunks. all manner of... Ah, yes, well, exactly, yes, yeah, and, uh, and gliders as well. See, this is, this, so is where, this is where it all fell apart for me, is that they, when they signed us up, 
at my school you could choose Navy, Army or RAF Cadet Force. And then when they signed us up, they said, well, you'll be flying planes. I never went near a bloody chipmunk. We just used to sit there in the geography classroom watching slides and we had to identify what the aircraft were. I've never well, been so bored in my I'll life. What, Go um, on. So I suspect what you're alleading to is the combined cadet forces. That's which exactly what it was. Much, yes. So, 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 so that, that, that is very much part of the private school and grammar school system within this country. Oh, what I'm talking about is, is, is the is, actual is, is, is RAF the cadet corps. wing, the ATC. Yeah, yeah co- quite. So I'm talking about the Air Training Corps, oh. which is part of the umbrella of the RAFAC with the RAF. Air cadets. Now, that is more for people who uh, go to state schools, very much like I did. There is no way on earth that I would have got the job I got now no. and do the things I can do now were it not for that organisation. I'm talking about initiative, leadership, confidence, all of those things that enable you to flourish in society. So mm. I would suggest that it's a really positive thing. And it will make money. It will help growth. You know, all of the things I, that they, I, I, that they bang on about all the time. The There's case. no downside. So, I, I mean, I hesitate to throw him a bone. But when Rishi Sunak was talking about national service, he probably somewhere inside is, well, he's doing two things. He's completely ignoring that, that, that his party have been responsible for hollowing out the whole world of youth clubs. But he probably has, if we were to be very generous, he may have had in mind something akin to what you're describing, but much later that, in life. That, that may or may not be. Well, I'm not entirely sure what no, nor am I. describing by using that language. Same. What I think we are offering is, is an entirely positive uh, like way to develop yourself um, at a time that you are hugely impressionable. Yes. Um, and at a time, I think it really can be make or break. So so that that will be my plug. Uh, no, I love RAF it. Thing. And you've done a great job. And, and people can Google it. What would they Google? They just Google RAF cadets, I presume, and they find it's, out. Exactly. And find out because there'll be a mum listening to this or a dad listening to this thinking, oh, do you know what? Little Keith, he'd love that. I got you know, Little Keith or little, little Janet, they'd love that. I'm going to get them all signed up for it. Um, and you won't regret it. And, and of course, it's not compulsory. So even if you do, um, you don't have to stay. It is 12.46. Up next, Natasha Clark, LBC's political editor, has been on the road with Rishi Sunak. Um, but I also have that remarkable moment in the relationship between right-wing politics, right-wing media and Rus- Russian interference and Brexit that appears in today's Daily Mail without anybody on the editorial staff noticing what they have finally acknowledged. It's 12.46. 12.49, so some pr- quick roundups of things I've been teasing you with all morning. I asked you which party had um, used a song in one of its campaign videos that has been banned across Europe for its far-right connotations. Answer, Reform UK Limited. I asked you which party's university student group had been forced to apologise after its members sang and danced to a Nazi song at a black tie event. Answer, Warwick University Conservative Association. And I asked you what appeared in the Daily Mail today that is a moment of enormous importance, which they failed to notice. Answer this. Um... He was responding to reports by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that Russian propagandists were covertly exerting their influence via a series of Facebook pages to boost support for Nigel Farage's Reform Party. The pages have a combined following of 190,000 people. Oliver Dowden called this gravely concerning and blamed malign foreign actors. This is an article written for the Mail by Neil Barnett, the co-author of Russia's hybrid war against the UK, time to fight back against the Kremlin. I am 99.9% certain that in his original copy, he would have included references to Brexit, but they have been removed by the editorial staff of the Daily Mail because, listen to this, five pages on Facebook are merely the tip of the iceberg. Russia employs thousands of computer operators to flood our social media networks with distortions, doctored reports and outrageous fabrications. Much of this disinformation can seem plausible. There's so much of it that fact-checking everything is impossible because the fake news spreads so fast and mutates so quickly. Even if it is later discredited, the damage has already been done. For example, in a marginal seat where the reform candidate has a chance of overturning a Tory majority, a fake story might start doing the rounds about how immigrants are monopolising local NHS dental services, forcing established residents to go private. And that is not only true in the case of what's happening at the moment and traced back by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to Russian propagandists. 
It's exactly what happened during Brexit, which the Daily Mail can't mention, of course, and which the Tories are complaining about now, having failed to investigate Russian interference in the Brexit referendum because they liked the result. And you didn't even need the Russians to do half of this because Dominic Cummings has actually acknowledged, as I write about in How They Broke Britain, but, but which has been reported nowhere else except Channel 4 News, that they spent a ton of money in the final days of the campaign seeding people's Facebook pages with precisely the sort of propaganda that you have just had described to you there. So wakey, wakey, Oliver Dowden. This kind of Russian propaganda propelled Brexit over the line and Boris Johnson into Downing Street. But now that it's helping Nigel Farage, suddenly you've recognised the scale of the problem. Uh, and speaking of the Conservative Party, Natasha Clark has been on the road with Rishi Sunak, who's in Staffordshire today. Natasha, what have you got? Yeah. Good afternoon, James. Yep, Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak both ramping up their call messages ahead of Pollen Day. And I'm here on the Tory bus today. We're in Stoke-on-Trent. The Prime Minister has been speaking to people at a pharmaceuticals factory the final few hours before we go to the polls. He warned people against sleepwalking into a Labour victory by giving them a huge supermajority. If these polls are right and Labour are in power with a supermajority, you have to think about what that will mean. A government, a Labour government, unchecked no one to hold them accountable, no one to stand up to them in Parliament, and all of the impact it would have on all of your lives. And I say this to you, if you hand Labour a blank cheque, you will not be able to get it back. And he also said he would stand up and fight for people. A little bit of a different messaging from the Prime Minister today. That sounds to me like he does admit and acknowledge that he might have already lost this election. Of course, he had denied this when we spoke to him just a few minutes ago. He also spoke quite powerfully about Nigel Farage's comments. He's turned his fire on the Reform Party leader in these final few days as he tries to stop the stem of those flow of votes to the Reform Party. He called those candidates racist and appalling. He made those... Uh, remarks about him last week. He now also turned his fire on to other candidates. He said there are multiple candidates who are now openly espousing racist and misogynist views, seemingly without challenge in the Reform Party. Look, I made my views on that pretty clear and I said he's got some questions to answer and I think he described the comments as inappropriate last time I heard, right? They weren't inappropriate. They were racist and appalling and the person who made them has apologised to reform for the impact it's had on them, right? Um, so, you know, that's that. And as I said, like, you've got now multiple reform candidates and campaigners openly espousing racist and misogynistic views, seemingly without challenge, tells you something about the culture within the Reform Party. We also asked him as well if he's hoping for a last minute turnaround in this campaign, very much like England last night. He was asked, are you hoping to have a Jude Bellingham moment and turn the polls around? He said, as I said last night, it's not over until it's over and he's fighting hard for every vote. And it's clear that he is obviously trying to throw as much of himself as he can in these final few days. And of course, for him, he's probably also thinking the end is also in sight. So yes, James, a very interesting few hours, I'm sure, will be to a observe the Tory campaign up front before we do go to the final polls on Thursday. Thursday indeed, safe journey home. Before you go, um, uh, Natasha, I can only think of 15 million reasons why Rishi Sunak wouldn't talk about Frank Hester's racism and misogyny in the same, with the same passion that he talked about reform candidates. Are there any other reasons or is it just the 15 million? Potentially so, and he was asked about this on the BBC yesterday, and he again insisted that Frank Hester had apologised for his remarks. Denied he was again, racist. Like Did the said, BBC presenter um, pick him up on that? Do you know? I didn't well, see Lewis it myself. Goodall Lewis Goodall uh, picked Oliver Dowden up when he picked him up on this yesterday. He said, no, he did not apologise for those racist remarks. Oliver Dowden would not use the words vile to describe what Frank Hester had said. He said he's not getting into anything on that. But yes, specifically, would not comment, would not say that the two were comparable, even though many people saying, look, you took this guy's money. Mm. You did not uh, chuck him out. So yes, uh, facing criticism for that as he tries to turn his, uh, turn his fire on the Reform Party and some of their racist candidates but again facing accusations about why he didn't do more to stop that money coming in from that uh, those, from that donor, Frank Hester, after he made those very racist remarks, which the Prime Minister eventually called out after a long time. Thank you very much, Natasha. Just those 15 million reasons then for that uh, complete uh, double standard being displayed by the Prime Minister, which is not in any way to dilute the horror of, as he described it himself, having his own children here 
what he was called by one of Farage's foot soldiers. Um, I, I think Farage is still claiming the bloke was a, was a, was a hoaxer while not mentioning at all the senior member of his inner circle who was talking about proper English and conflating homosexuality with paedophilia. Um, but hey-ho, uh, I guess leopards and spots spring to mind. It's coming up to 12.57. LBC's political correspondent, Aggie Chambray, is on the road with Keir Starmer today, and she will join Sheila Fogarty a little later this afternoon to report on how the opposition are faring in this final week of election campaigning. Do you know how big a wombat I am? I do this thing sometimes in the back of my mind while I'm talking to you, while I'm thinking, what else have I got to do this week? What's on the agenda? Am I doing something later? I've got to go and get my... I hope you're not having your lunch. I've got to go and get my ears syringed this afternoon. So that's constantly thinking about little things. And in, I, I'm, I've got this idea in my head. There's something happening on Thursday. I'm sure I'm doing something on Thursday, but there's nothing on my calendar. What is it that's happening on Thursday? It's a bloody election, you prune. I'm doing an event. There's no tickets left, so I, I, I won't give you any details about it. It'll just be teasing you. But I I've somehow contrived to conduct an entire show largely about looming general election issues, having forgotten that, that what's happening. Something's happening on Thursday. I just can't quite put my finger on it. Um, that's it, really, for today. My apologies to everybody waiting to talk about youth clubs. I, I, I'm going to have to change my entire attitude to that subject, but I think we've got the wheels turning already on that process. They're clearly a matter of enormous, enormous importance. And if somebody who, I hope, recognises the disparity in experience, the role that privilege plays in our society, and, and the iniquities of much of our status quo, if someone like me can have failed to fully appreciate their importance, imagine how people like David Cameron and, and Rishi Sunak have approached them. How could anyone have countenanced the destruction of, of youth clubs answer, they had no idea whatsoever about how important they are. And that's why this research shared with The Guardian today about what young people want and, and the scale of the destruction that has happened to the sector makes for such alarming reading. That is it from me for another day. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or just head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. 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 It's time for Sheila. 